Okay, we're going to we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Leticia Alejandres, and I'm the director of Telehealth and Human Services at the California Emerging Technology Fund. Um, I just have a few uh, housekeeping or technology related uh, matters that I wanted to make sure that I announced to everyone. First of all, this session is being recorded, so please be mindful of that. All of the agenda and background documents have been sent to you. However, if you would like to use the chat, you will see that they're there on a link if you'd like to just um, access them that way. All attendees will be on mute. If you have a question, we encourage you to please use, use the chat feature. If you happen to experience technical difficulties while on the call, please use your, use your chat feature and one of the CETF team members will st is standing by and will assist you. And lastly, for the best listening and visual experience, we recommend that you set your computer to speaker mode. And the way that you can do that is go to the right upper hand cor corner of your screen and you'll see it says gallery view or speaker view. You'll want speaker view. It'll make it less distracting and make for a better experience for listening. So with that, we will begin. And uh, just again, just as a reminder, uh, everyone, you are on mute and you will remain on mute. Uh, Rosa Guerrero is um, standing by, who is managing, she's at the controls, as I like to say, and she'll be unmuting our speakers as we move forward. And so with that, I want to pass it over to Barb Johnston Yellowlees. Hi, welcome everyone. I'd like to start this by saying thanks to everyone who's contributed to today's convening. Uh, this has been uh, an amazing uh, work in progress uh, with Leticia, uh, spending unbelievable hours communicating with people all over our state. So thanks to everybody and especially to Leticia. I was talking to Sunny yesterday about what happened a mere 15 years ago it's just, it's mind boggling. 15 years ago, Sunny had organized and ran a different convening. And that convening in 2005 was really focused on trying to come up with some ideas to drive economic vitality for rural California. I think she was surprised that the room was absolutely packed. Um, you know, Sunny, I don't think it was the box lunches that brought everybody. <laughs> and I know it wasn't what said, kept everybody in the room. The, the people who came had so many different ideas. Um, it was one of those unusual meetings where everybody was fighting to talk. You know how you take the little white card and turn your name aside because uh, raising your hand wasn't working. It just was very high energy. People really wanted to express some really innovative ideas and it was very exciting. Um, I, of course, was the voice bringing up telemedicine constantly. I'd been working in telemedicine for a long time. At the time, I was the executive director of the California Telemedicine uh, Center and uh, actually had spent quite a bit of time on the road for oh, about two years running around with Kathy Chorba, who now runs the California uh, Telehealth Resource Center. And we were trying to get people to understand what does that word mean? I must say in almost every meeting that Kathy and I did together across the state of California, very few people knew what that word was. They're like, telephone, what? So we've come a long ways. And I think we're all excited to see what can come out of the two day convening that we um, have got on the calendar now. Uh, the one thing that did come out over and over again from Sunny's first convening that 15 years ago was the need for broadband to support the expansion of telemedicine across the state of California. I think the reasons are pretty obvious now. Uh, COVID has made it really obvious. Uh, I don't know if you guys are aware, but the uh, American Medical Association reports that the increase in the use of telemedicine in, after the first two months of COVID was 8,000%. It's phenomenal. So following that meeting, CETF was created and Sunny became the CEO. CETF has been focused ever since on closing the digital divide in California by deployment and the adoption of broadband. That's what we do. 
CETF provided the initial seed funding to create the California Telehealth Network. See, Sunny was the was on the CTN board. She represented CETF for many, many years. More recently, when COVID struck, our board had a long discussion about what was going on. What could we do? How could we have some effect on what was happening? And I think one of the things that struck us most de deeply at the time was every night on the news, we were hearing horror stories about what was happening to residents in nursing homes. Uh, it, was, it was heartbreaking and we knew we couldn't solve everything, but we thought, well, why don't we set up, fund an initiative to set up a model program for implementing telemedicine in nursing homes? And then Sunny did something really good. She hired Letizia. Letizia came on and she was brought on to develop and become the lead for the CETF initiative to develop a model program for telemedicine and nursing homes. As we were bring, talking to people all over the state about this idea, the different associations, people who represent all the people who work in those nursing homes and senior care centers, we found out there were a lot of challenges and some recommendations to promote telemedicine across our state. So these two days, these convenings, we are seeking to encourage discussion. We want to gather information, share ideas, find out what's working, ask for recommendations. What could, what could be improved? What could we do? Some of the ideas that I would like personally to have included in the discussion over the next two days include three things that are kind of near and dear to my heart that I've been working on um, for a long time. The first one is a suggestion that we have a national license for doctors. Because of COVID, cross-state cross licensing is allowed. It's been working out just fine. So what are, what's the next step? What happens after COVID? The second one is reimbursement. One of the most significant changes was the, because of COVID, there is no geographical bar barrier for reimbursement. And the third thing is because of COVID, doctors are allowed to prescribe controlled substances via telemedicine. That affects two groups specifically that have always been uh, left out and probably many more, but the two groups that I've been concerned about for many years are people who, suffering, who are suffering from addiction. Because of COVID, they can now get their medications that they need uh, via telemedicine. And the second group are children with ADHD the kids who need Ritalin, and the kids that are affected the most are underserved children. It's very hard for them to get these medications, but now they can get the medications they need. I think the last thing that we, we may at some point discuss is the need to look at HIPAA. HIPAA came out in the 90s, and it might be time to review it, not as a complaint, but just a consideration of what does it mean? What are the, uh, those rules and regulations that were put in place so many years ago? How does that relate to telemedicine? So with that, welcome. We're very excited to see so many people uh, on, on the call and look forward to, to the next two days. And I, I think I'm taking uh, the responsibility from um, my orders that Leticia Alejandrez gave, it, gave me, and so Barb Johnston Yellowies as well, to facilitate today. So I'm Sunny McPeak with the California Emerging Technology Fund. And I am uh, extraordinarily impressed with the expertise that is on this call. Um, we are very, very grateful for your participation. Um, I do want to also do a little bit of a reflection on what Barb has said going back 15 years ago. The um, setting was actually I was a, a member of the governor's cabinet and secretary of business, transportation and housing. And all of the cabinet uh, secretaries were listening uh, to stakeholders, leaders around the state. We did 17 listening sessions uh, about economic vitality. And this particular occasion was actually organized by Trish Kelly, uh, the California Center uh, for uh, Regional Leadership. And it was sponsored by the California Endowment and the Humboldt Area Foundation. 
to focus on rural economic development. And to the surprise of all of us uh, in the cabinet, the issue that was identified by more than 60 participants in that room was the need for broadband. The need for broadband to enable public safety, quality of life, economic development, Literally, none of us expected that that would be the number one issue that came to the top. And it was then that I listened first to and met Barb Johnston Yellowlees, who um, uh, kept uh, advancing so many ideas that she got tagged with the responsibility to write a report. So in full disclosure, it's Barb who taught me how to spell telehealth. It is Barb who has been the pioneer and the visionary in this field. And it was Barb's report that the Public Utilities Commission relied on in 2005 and cited it when they negotiated a public benefit from uh, corporate consolidations that were pending before the California Public Utilities Commission. In 2005, SBC bought AT&T, kept the name AT&T, and Verizon bought MCI. The California Public Utilities Commission, led by then Susan Kennedy and Mike Peavy, had the idea to establish the California Emerging Technology Fund. They came up with this name even. It's in the order. And um, I, I will say the companies didn't actually think that was a voluntary agreement, uh, particularly, but they uh, provided the seed capital, the board was constituted, and I uh, had the honor of being recruited by the board to come serve as president and CEO of the California Emerging Technology Fund. At the first meeting I was at, it was Barb Yellowies that said, we're going to put up the capital to uh, match the FCC's program for rural healthcare pilot projects. That's how we got into uh, being interested in telehealth. They were also doing research around what causes people to actually use the technology. Deployment, i.e. infrastructure is very, very important, but people won't use technology, which is only a tool, unless it's relevant to them. And one of the most sought after uses, we often call it an application from a consumer customer point of view, is healthcare. When someone gets connected, one of the first things they do is start looking for health information. How do they connect to their doctor? How do they do things online that relates to their personal well-being? And therein lies that sort of convergence of the infrastructure that is needed, the programs that it connects to. We are very pleased that not only all of you are on this call, but we've got a super majority of the board of the California Emerging Technology Fund. So we have our chair, uh, Barbara O'Connor, our treasurer, uh, CFO, Rich Mata, our vice chair, Renee Martinez, and you will hear from Jim Kirkland and Dorian Traub later as responders, and Martha Escutia also is joining us former senator, and speaking of former legislators, our legislative representative in Sacramento, uh, former uh, state senator Richard Polanco, who also founded the Latino Caucus, is joining us. May I also say that sort of in this collection of all of you experts and uh, trailblazers, we've got sort of two groups that we hope come together. The convergence will be absolutely explosive and transforming for California. So all of you who have the telehealth, healthcare expertise are now joining in a conversation with all of our partners, CETF partners, in the world of digital equity. Uh, we have a number of leaders from our regional consortia. Uh, David Espinosa is here from uh, Valley Vision who has the Sacramento Valley area. Uh, Marianne Leffel from Monterey Bay is on. I saw Mike Nichols join from North Bay. Uh, it's an amazing, we have Paola Hernandez from United Ways of California because we have a number of nonprofit community organizations that help us with getting people online 
uh, to actually adopt broadband. So that's who's on this call today. Uh, an amazing, impressive group. And we are very, very honored that we have partner co-sponsor organizations who are helping us uh, listen and uh, take what you are saying to provide to the administration and legislature, the uh, council around why an investment in broadband infrastructure is essential to support telehealth at home. Up until this point, we actually have focused on the connections between providers and medically underserved communities, often the federally qualified health centers, uh, the rural health centers, uh, other community clinics to be connected to medical centers and expertise so that we could afford the best health care to all Californians. In March, everything changed. With an emergency response to the pandemic that sent everybody home, and now we have 12 million people online simultaneously every day trying to do distance learning, connect to their doctors, work from home, and we've got to figure out this new world of getting everyone connected for basic public protection, let alone saving time, saving money. So the governor, uh, Governor ne uh, Gavin Newsom issued an executive order in August calling on the state agencies to develop an action plan, an action plan that uh, is broadband for all. Um, there has been a lot of debate in the legislature around uh, healthcare, telehealth, telemedicine. Uh, also distance learning, and all of this kind of input from a variety of forms is being taken into account in writing that action plan that is due to the governor, by the way, by the end of 2020, in December. So the California Department of Technology, as we speak, is, 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 is feverishly gathering input and writing the plan. So with that, let me turn to our partners in this whole process and uh, begin with Partners in Care Foundation and June Simmons that I had the opportunity to meet because David Panish contacted me after seeing um, an opinion editorial that controller Betty Yee wrote and was in the Sacramento Bee. And so David is in this uh, conversation and nobody who joins a conversation with us gets out without being given an assignment. So just know you will be tagged, you will be given uh, something to do just like I gave to Barb uh, 15 years ago and, and we can blame her for what we're now doing, uh, but you can also give her credit for why we're doing this. And June founded uh, Partners in Care, um, I think in 1997, uh, if I've got that right, June, but I've just been so impressed because not only you're focused on serving elderly and seniors, but here's what is the hallmark of Partners in Care. They look at social determinants. They look at social determinants outcomes. I wanna keep that in mind because sometimes we lose focus, even if we're doing broadband on what is it about, it's helping people. We need to see if it makes a difference in their lives. In full disclosure, I actually have a, a, a degree in public health um, and uh, started out in that whole arena. And the issue is how do we make Californians healthier? Not how we just deliver health services, not how we um, fund and, 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 and properly resource our clinics and our medical centers. That's important, but it's an input to the outcome of are we actually getting people well and better? And that is what Partners in Care Foundation can do. So let me introduce June Simmons to make remarks. Thank you, June. Well, thank you so much. It's an honor to join in supporting this incredible work. Your energy and vision, you and your board, and your staff are fantastic. We are a not-for-profit and our purpose is to achieve better health outcomes by marrying social care and medical care. So we are also change agents as you are and under COVID, uh, we have many, many people that we watch that we help stay at home, uh, to stay out of nursing homes, stay out of hospitals, uh, set, find medical homes instead of continuous ER use. And uh, so we identified the tremendous gap that these people had as 
their medical offices were hard to reach. They couldn't get meds renewed. Food, of course, basics. So we look at all those things. But we were searching urgently for how do we keep people connected and how do we enhance the way they're connected. So the emergency telehealth changes were great. We're very interested in visual as well because among other driving health factors we've discovered recently, loneliness and social isolation are powerful drivers. They shorten the lifespan by seven years. It's the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a, a day. It's very powerful. So we were thrilled to, to join the uh, leadership, the skills, and the, the uh, agenda uh, that CETF brings. And so we're very appreciative of being here and co-sponsoring with you. Thank you, June. And let me now turn to a, a, a forever patient and faithful partner, Scenic and Lewis Fox, uh, their CEO, who came to California uh, a number of years ago from Washington State. Uh, CENIC, C-E-N-I-C, uh, actually when it was formed, stood for, still does, the Corporation for Educational Network Initiatives in California. Uh, I love it when an organization uses, has, has a acronym as the name and then we always have to put in parentheses, what does it stand for? But here's what CENIC does, starting out to connect all of the research institutions and higher education institutions in California with high-speed internet uh, connectivity uh, to enable research. Uh, their uh, mission has been continuously expanded by the state legislature and the administration. It includes all of K-12 uh, education, the county offices of education, and libraries. Very importantly, all of the medical centers which are the home to the uh, medical expertise in this state are part of Scenic. And so it is in that context that Lewis is also joining with uh, this convening and listening session. I also wanna thank you, Lewis, for being so helpful in understanding and your members understanding that until we get ubiquitous broadband and every Californian online, the mission of research cannot be fully served as well. So thank you, Lewis Fox. Uh, we uh, appreciate Scenic being a partner. Uh, listen, we'll listen to your uh, lovely remarks now. Thank you, Sonny. Um, it's uh, really an honor and a joy to uh, partner with CETF and you and uh, uh, participate in this event. Scenic is a not-for-profit. Um, as Sunny said, we we uh, connect all of education uh, in California uh, and libraries. Um, there are about twelve thousand institutions that connect to our network, um, and about twenty million Californians um, are on our network. Um, you know what happened um, this last March is many of those twenty million uh, Californians were at home. And we had to think about how do we assist with the continuity of, uh, of education, of healthcare, um, and uh, of employment. Uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, many, many employees. Uh, for instance, um, uh, UC San Francisco, 60% of their uh, uh, employees were working from home. Um, as, as somebody said, we connect uh, 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 seven large university medical centers and multiple hospitals. We ha also connect uh, other healthcare in California, um, uh, the Montage, uh, Montage Health and, and Community Hospital, uh, uh, City of Hope, and so on. And um, each of them are concerned about reaching um, uh, their constituents um, through telehealth. For example, UCSF went from 3,600 telehealth uh, sessions in March to 50,000 that month. And that's been true uh, across the board. So we have been working with residential networks uh, to peer our, our networks so the traffic actually doesn't have to go over the commercial internet. Uh, it can go directly to those peer networks. Um, what I, what I, uh, uh, next uh, session, December, uh, you'll have a chance to meet uh, Dr. Jim Marson, who uh, is the head of uh, the uh, health and technology 
Center at uh, UC Davis Health. And Jim describes uh, what he does as moving knowledge, not people. And that's really um, kind of center stage for us uh, at Scenic. And we look forward to uh, having this conversation with you and understanding how we can continue to help. Thank you so much, Lewis. And if you've got the medical centers on one end, on the other, uh, there's a lot in between. But let me just say, are the providers who are in the medically underserved communities, the federally qualified health centers, uh, the rural health centers, the, uh, uh, the point of contact in the community, the community clinics. And so we're so delighted that the California Primary Care Association has joined as a as a co-convener in listening. And it is great to see Andy Martinez Patterson, Peterson, excuse me, Andy. It, it actually is Patterson. Uh, I think we've got the wrong, somehow there's the wrong thing up there. See, I do know you. And Andy and I got the chance to um, serve together on um, the California Telehealth Network Board. And that's how I met Andy. She uh, continued to serve through uh, being pregnant and a mother and handling everything else. Uh, and so it's wonderful to have you back. She is vice president, heads up their policy. Thank you, Andy, for joining us. Thanks, Sunny. So nice to see you again. And so nice to see all these people who care so much about broadband and telehealth. Um, California Primary Care Association represents the community clinics and the health centers across California. And we have long, long been proponents of telehealth and expanded broadband access. And our rural members have long been pushing us to do even more all the time. They've been our innovators here. And I will say with COVID, we've been pushing on this for a long time, haven't gotten much traction. And then with COVID, what felt like two weeks to get the flexibility and the payment for telehealth, it actually took three days when I look back on it. I have to commend Department of Healthcare Services for responding so quickly. Health centers had the flexibility and were stabilized quickly. We did drop a lot in visits because we predominantly serve our patients and our members through face-to-face -face visits, but health centers have rebounded as we know that they would. And about 80% of visits, some of 80% of visits to some health centers are via telehealth, but predominantly through telephonic because we have broadband challenges, because we have so much inequi digital inequity, um, because of the cost, because of rural and access for so many reasons. So we are so pleased to be here and to be partners and we will continue to fight with everybody to ensure equity in broadband and telehealth delivery. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andy. And let me just underscore something you said, which is the uh, remote visits during COVID have been mostly by telephone. That's what we've all def defaulted to, as opposed to being able to talk like this, where a, uh, a provider, a physician, a nurse, an allied health provider can actually look at the, the patient. And uh, we want to underscore that as we're making recommendations to the administration in response to the governor's executive order that the performance standard has to be for every Californian, all 40 million, uh, all 13 uh, million households that you can support telehealth and distance learning uh, with the technology at home, which means adequate bandwidth, adequate speeds, a fiber network and um, a more symmetrical networks uh, because you need this two-way communication. So having said that, the, the thank you, uh, partners for these uh, eloquent remarks and providing the context. We are so delighted that we also have representatives of the administration, the governor's office, and uh, the legislature uh, to help call to action and uh, tell us uh, what we need to do and what our marching orders are. And on your agenda, you'll see that Richard Figueroa is, is scheduled to speak, although in, uh, in Richard's uh, 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 total uh, style of managing policy, he insists on deferring to uh, assembly member, Dr. Joaquin Arambula to go first. He, kn he knows actually Joaquin where the power is and, uh, and nothing comes to the governor's office to sign if it doesn't come through you first. So uh, from uh, the San Joaquin Valley where I grew up, and I wanna say uh, Joaquin that Eduardo Gonzalez from CSU Fresno and our San Joaquin Valley um, Regional Consortium has just uh, has just joined. I'm calling him out because he's late, but I will call out people and give you assignments. So, uh, just want to acknowledge uh, Eduardo has joined. Uh, but Dr. 
and let me repeat that. Dr. Joaquin Arambula, who is an emergency room physician in the San Joaquin Valley, who understands the challenges of rural California of trying to access medical expertise. If you are the doc with someone coming through that emergency room and you need to know immediately uh, uh, a consult, how do you get to a medical center? Uh, Dr. Arambula has served in the legislature now for several terms, and I, I just have to say, Joaquin, I can't help but feeling like a proud mother because I have had the opportunity to work with Joaquin's dad. Juan was in the uh, legislature. His mom, Amy, always was there, and so we, we San Joaquin Valley kids have a way of looking at uh, if something's broke, we're gonna get it fixed because if we don't fix it, we don't eat. It's a really compelling equation. So uh, we're looking to Dr. Aramula, Assembly Member uh, Joaquin Aramula for leadership, um, continuing leadership in the world of telehealth. Thank you, Joaquin, for joining. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you, Sonny, and uh, good morning to everyone. It's an honor to be here with you, at least virtually, uh, today to focus on the promise of telehealth and the transformative change that healthcare is delivered and can be delivered during this pandemic. For those of you who don't know me, I represent uh, uh, Fresno County, 41% of the city of Fresno and all of the rural cities in my community. And my district is in the same area where I grew up now. To be more specific, we talk about zip codes being more predictive than your genetic code. And I live in the same zip code that I grew up in. That zip code is one of the most disadvantaged zip codes we have in our state. And so as we are going through this pandemic and as we recognize that there are social determinants of health that are predicated by our zip code, we should also look towards the fact that life expectancies can be vastly different in similar cities. In the city of Fresno, where I grew up, I went to high school on the wrong side of the track. And 10 miles away where my wife went to school, they have a life expectancy that can be as large and different as 20 years. That's significant when you live in the same city and you realize you don't have those same opportunities. And so I look towards telehealth. I look towards this as actually an opportunity for us to realize that we can increase access to care. Now, I personally cared for 50,000 patients firsthand. I worked in Selma, which is our raisin capital of the world. And oftentimes what I saw is that when our patients, our communities of color aren't getting access to care, what's happening to them is they are getting sicker and they are dying sooner. And so I really believe that this is an important time for us to focus on access to care within telemedicine and within telehealth so that we can increase access to our communities of color. Now, our new reality requires us to meet this moment by investing in modalities that will bolster and enhance equitable access and delivery to telehealth. And I believe fundamentally and support all of the work to increase access for telehealth and to aggressively respond to the social inequities which are illuminated by this once in a century pandemic. Now this shelter in place and physical distancing orders have highlighted the need for all Californians to be able to use telehealth and has exposed the existing digital access inequities, especially for our communities of color living in our rural areas. It is imperative that we invest in constructing high-speed internet infrastructure capable of supporting telehealth services to get all residents online with appropriate devices and improve digital literacy. The digital divide is real and co our communities are experiencing deeper poverty and greater isolation. We have to look towards affordability language and cultural competencies and meet the needs of our patients and of our communities. This convening of telehealth will allow us the opportunity to identify the gaps and barriers and to optimize telehealth and improve the health for all Californians. And ultimately, develop an action plan to advance telehealth policy in our state. I look forward to engaging with you all. Thank you again for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. Thank you so much, 
assembly member, Dr. Joaquin Arambula, we appreciate your commitment and your, and your leadership. Um, we, uh, we know why uh, Richard Figueroa wanted to defer to you, and now I get to call upon uh, Deputy Cabinet Secretary Richard Figueroa, who has served in uh, three administrations, and I will just tell you that I learned early on, if we're going to talk about healthcare or telehealth, everything goes through uh, Richard Figueroa. Everybody calls him FIG. And uh, nothing gets passed uh, without uh, uh, FIG being uh, involved and approving uh, uh, the whole action. And so uh, we were very grateful uh, when Barb and I were charged by our board of directors in March, uh, let's uh, do something in, in healthcare. And in fact, our board uh, has a pilot with skilled nursing facilities and and uh, senior residential centers for telehealth. Uh, the first call uh, was to Richard Figueroa. Only it took Leticia Alejandres to get his attention. Uh, and I will say in the middle of all this pandemic, I am uh, always impressed and, and really grateful that Richard is willing to continue to provide his counsel. And so we are delighted that Richard is here to uh, share the perspective from Governor Gavin Newsom's administration, the governor's office, Deputy Secretary uh, Richard Figueroa. Great. Uh, thank you for being here. If it looks a little awkward, I have a monitor that has no camera, so I have to look at an iPad to <laughs> talk, but I see people over here, so it's a little awkward. So just so I'm going to look at my iPad, so I'm not looking at you. It's, okay. Um, so just, again, I very much appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to be here. I appreciate everything that's been said. Before, I want to thank the, the sponsors. Um, obviously, we've talked a bit about the necessity to kind of build out uh, the necessary broadband capabilities to kind of make this reality. I very much appreciate um, CTS stepping up and, and working with the nursing homes to, to start kind of a, a pilot, which we hope to be a model. I would just say generally, um, and I know you're short on time and all, but just, you know, clearly COVID-19 uh, required some changes in the way that healthcare is delivered. During the pandemic, um, we knew we needed to reduce staff exposure to ill persons. We knew we had to preserve PPE or, or personal protective equipment. And we knew we had to minimize the impact of surge on facilities. Those are the really things that really kind of drove us early in, in, in this um, and why you saw such a you know, tremendous amount of action in that area. Um, it was also clear to us early on that the telehealth was um, necessary to help provide uh, necessary care to patients while minimizing the transmission risk, um, both the healthcare personnel, patients, and the community at large. So while telehealth technology um, and its use are obviously not, not new, I would say that it wasn't, the adoption wasn't as widespread um, uh, early on, but I think some recent changes during the pandemic have really reduced the barriers to telehealth and promoted the use of telehealth as a way, you know, to, to deliver this care. I would say that, that you know, we have worked with insurance payers um, and healthcare professional associations who have supported the transition to telehealth during the pandemic. And certainly the federal CMS or Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has issued multiple waivers, um, giving us flexibility in terms of like geographic location, type of health site during the pandemic and, and granting payment parity between telehealth and uh, in-person clinical care. So with that, with that additional flexibility, and, and Andy talked about this earlier, we immediately moved to um, implement a whole variety of, of flexibilities through both the Department of Managed Healthcare, Department of Healthcare Services, and many of you have obviously seen the various guidances and things and notices that went out um, from, from those regulatory and payment um, agencies to do this. Um, so, you know, whether it's synchronous, asynchronous, remote, remote patient monitoring, and all the different terms that, that we use, um, um, we're very interested in seeing what what we do next. Now, I would say that, that um, you know, there was a bill in the legislature this year, B-2164 by um, Mr. Rivas and Mr. Salas um, that would have enshrined some of those flexibilities in statute. The governor did veto it, um, but what he said was that, and I'll just kind of quote from it. He says, well, I'm supportive of utilizing telehealth to increase access to primary and specialty care services. Uh, DHCS is currently in the process of evaluating its global telehealth policy to determine what temporary flexibility should be extended beyond the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So I, I, my charge to this group and to others have been working on this, and it's very, very, I would say it's super timely um, because we are trying to figure out, the governor is committed to telehealth. We are very interested in trying to figure out like what of these elements we need to keep. Obviously, I would say that some of these things were 
um, the flexibilities were only available under federal flexibilities. And so, so we've been kind of wary about um, doing things that would just be general fund only, not to say that we wouldn't do them, but we're being kind of wary of, of doing that right away. But again, you know, we have a very strong commitment from the governor's office as, as expressed in the veto message um, that we are trying to figure like, what are this, you know, what have we learned um, in, from this pandemic? What have we learned about the type of modalities, issues that have come up about parity um, uh, that we can then try to figure out how we move forward? Again, I, I don't think it's clear to me we're never going back to the old days. I mean, this is like the biggest telehealth pilot you could ever, ever, ever have imagined. I mean, much like me, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the governor's office bubble. So I work here and I get my temperature tested five times a day and all this kind of stuff. But, but even for state workforce, I would say, even the state, the state was in the same situation with its own workforce, right? Very, very limited tele, telework pilots. We all went to telework overnight. So, you know, we're, we're trying to apply those same learnings in the way that we had to adapt and kind of get with the program and move toward the future. We're taking those internal learnings and applying them to the broader practice and scope of the things that government now works through, including our Medicaid program, for example, Medi-Cal. So again, you have our commitment, we're listening, we're open, we want to, we want to, you know, take in all the learnings from this group and other work that's kind of going on to figure out kind of what we do. I know people were worried about, you know, gee, would there be a gap if the federal government somehow um, pulled back on its own finding of emergency? They haven't. Um, and so there'll be, you know, adequate time to work with, who, you know, if there's a current administration, new administration, new Congress, um, the legislature when they come back um, to, to work on these things. So again, you have our commitment to work on these things. We are very interested in trying to figure out how we, we do this. And again, we want to take the learnings from this and incorporate them. So that when we talk to Mr. Rambula, uh, next year about the budget and bills and things like that. We have kind of a, a strategy in place. And again, building on all the other efforts that um, uh, Ms. McPeak has noted about our broadband efforts, which are also ongoing. Because of course, you know, we can have really wonderful telehealth policies, but if you don't have the pipes, you know, and the connections to get there, they don't they don't mean very much. And so we're we're very cognizant of that well. So I'll I'll shut up and let you get on. But, but again, you have a commitment from us to keep the lines of communication opening and 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 learn from your own learnings. So thank you. Thank you, Richard. And uh, Deputy Secretary Figueroa, Assemblymember Arambula, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine a better call to action and charge to all of us. And we thank you for your time. And uh, I think all of us should take this as um, an opportunity, an invitation, and actually an assignment to get them the recommendations they need for both the infrastructure and whatever policy um, is needed. I, a, a lot of you are putting your comments in chat. I want to assure you that each of those is going to get answered and we'll go back to the people who can get the answers. So please continue the chat. We've asked our director, Jim Kirkland, to actually respond, if you will, to, um, to Fig and to Joaquin. Uh, Jim is a founding member of the California Emerging Technology Fund Board uh, of Directors. He is the general counsel for Trimble Incorporated, lives in San Jose, uh, Jim Kirkland. Thanks, Sonny. And, and it's so great to hear all the speakers so far, and particularly the call to action from the last two speakers. Um, I have been honored to serve with CETF from the beginning. And, you know, CETF is about bridging the digital divide. So providing the broadband pipes that we use for so many things, uh, and many of us take for granted. But what this crisis has really highlighted is there is a huge divide. And when you're on the wrong side of the divide, you can be denied access to healthcare, you can be denied access to education. And so we really do believe that this crisis should highlight that broadband should be a civil right, not just for healthcare and not just for education, but also for all the economic opportunities that are associated with it. Um, you know, the good news is CTF has been working on this issue from the connectivity standpoint for over 15 years. And, and so the, the bad news is, and I, I got to say, I was just struck because I have never thought of telehealth, the tele being telephone. I always thought telehealth was television, you know, or video. And the, the idea that 15 years in, you know, we've had this transformation in the delivery of healthcare to go to telehealth, you know, to take advantage of the remote access to healthcare, to take advantage of specialty care in markets that haven't had it. And we're using the telephone, um, I gotta say is just very distressing. So the good news is we have the learning. CETF is 
done work in the connectivity side. We recognized from the start that connectivity wasn't just a virtue in itself. It was for things like telehealth. Um, and the good news is that everyone that's participating in this call has been working on this issue from different angles. And I think the power of us as a group to advance this agenda is tremendous. And I personally want to thank on behalf of CETF and the CETF board, all the participants today. Uh, and I, I really, I know this will be part of transforming healthcare delivery in the state and making telehealth video so doctors can see their patients, patients can see their doctors and not, not the telephone. So thanks to everyone. Um, and uh, uh, we couldn't be more excited to convene this event and to try to draw on all the many strengths, all the many efforts that people are participating in this call. Let's, let's pull together and, uh, and really seize this moment. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Uh, as we turn to the next segment of the listening session today, let me just uh, describe the arc of what we're doing today and on December 2nd, which is we're starting with briefings from experts who have been in the field giving us a context of the policy and the practice. And then uh, two panels today, one from the community clinic practitioners and then the skilled nursing facilities. And then on December 2nd, that we're uh, hearing from the managed healthcare plans, such as Kaiser, and uh, we have Carla Rodriguez Lomax listening from San Jose today, uh, who heads up KP there. Thank you, Carla. I just want you to know I'm giving you an assignment to take it back to our uh, advisory board for the city of San Jose. And also uh, then the medical center. So that's the arc, but we're just delighted to start with a briefing and uh, to say that uh, everybody has scrambled a lot uh, so that uh, uh, Kim Kublinger would, would be here to uh, address us from the, from the California Telehealth Network. She is president, which is part of OCHIN, uh, which, which is also like Scenic. It was the Oregon Center for Connected uh, Information, uh, OCHIN Information Networks. Healthcare networks, and so Ochin uh, now has CTN as a part of it, and uh, Kim is also the chief experience officer, another CEO uh, title <laughs> uh, for for um, for uh, us to take into our, our lexicon. So Kim is here, but Kim only is here because I want to say uh, that. Uh, Kathy uh, Turba and uh, Rebecca Pisano, P Picasso actually listened to us, uh, Leticia and I, on Monday and said, yes, we, need, we really need to be involved. So, Kim, uh, thank you. The, the, the beauty of the technology is when we're doing things virtually that you didn't have to travel from Oregon and that we actually <laughs> are connected, right, because we can make this happen on a short-term basis. So, thank you, Kim, very much for joining us. Oh, thank you guys so much. Um, and I've actually just had to um, dab my eyes a couple of times <laughs> because um, I just am just so grateful and thankful for the early vision, the 15 year ago plus early vision um, by Sunny and Barbara and everyone else that's, that's you know, been, been doing this. I, just a tiny bit of a background. Um, I've been kind of running alongside a CTN uh, since 2009, as, pro as Sunny probably knows. Uh, I started Oregon Health Network in 2009 in Oregon, literally in my attic, <laughs> literally, uh, with also three little kids, um, because I knew in all of my background that uh, broadband connectivity and access to telehealth was really what needed to, to happen. Uh, Dr. David Harry and Dr. Tom Nesbitt and I would be sitting at night on the phone trying to figure out how to apply and get through the logistical hurdles of the FCC applications. And uh, I would write the part participation agreement contracts for Dr. David Harry and email them to, to him. And, and he, he would help uh, figure out for me, you know, some of the FCC uh, requirements. Uh, so that was pre-Eric. 
Um, and then Eric and I would, uh, once Eric joined, Eric and I would get on the plane at 6 a.m., fly to D.C., and together uh, spend a lot of time really uh, letting the FCC know the boots on the ground stories. I'm a boots on the ground person. So really, what does it mean? What the need is? And then we go over to USAC and we walk them through how to administer this and we go back up to the FCC again. So, you know, I've been running alongside a CTN um, and then the original company that I founded, Oregon Health Network, again, just with that vision that I've been sharing with you, but appreciate you guys being before me um, in, in really promoting access to broadband, especially in our rural, uh, you know, California and Oregon share about 67% of the state, roughly both are rural. Um, and so we, we definitely share a lot of that geography. So um, I, I have a couple of slides, not a lot. Um, I really want to make sure, you know, about it, to leave some time in for questions and then also uh, May. So I'll, I'll, just, I'll just keep going forward. Is someone gonna forward the slides for me? Okay, so who are we? Again, I've kind of touched, you know, CTN as uh, promoted and fostered the provisioning of broadband. Uh, Sunny and the board and, um, you know, California uh, Telehealth Fund, Merging Telehealth Fund, everybody has really been putting their shoulders to the wheel for a long time. Um, under CTN is the TRC, again, Kathy Torba, uh, Barbara, I, I know and understand all those long car rides. And she, she, you guys have been in it for a really long time, again, as early founders and adopters. Um, the TRC, you know, and one of the things that I think we all collectively sh could recognize only receives $325,000 a year under HRSA. Let me give you some numbers. What our four lovely people under the TRC has been doing with such a small amount of money just since COVID, just since April, they have individually supported 6,144 individual inquiries about how to use and promote telehealth. They have held since April, 28 separate events. They are doing a lot with very little. And I think collectively, you know, how can we continue to band together as, as the state of California in order to continue to put energy underneath their wings and our wings to drive the, the work that we're all doing together. Um, you know, we, we just are so proud, so proud of the commitment that has been, um, that is being exhibited both by Kathy and her team and then the state collectively. So I think that's important for people to know. If we go to the next slide, please. Together, you know, we look at redesigning healthcare for complex patients. Kathy and I, Kathy, uh, you know, is, is part of the team that I'm fortunate to be on. Together, we're always looking at the patient view, especially the rural patient view. How do we get them broadband? How do we get them to access to telehealth? How do we make sure that we are providing consultations so that they can adopt the telehealth tools, e-consults, interpreter services? We have got to continue to add interpreter services so we don't have those barriers of language. Um, so important. Access to social services resource locators. If you're in rural, if you're a rural California, how can I help get my patient connected to a local food bank? How can I get them access and, and, and connected, right, to, to uh, subsidized housing? How do I do that? And so the I is always with the foundation, which Sunny, you know, the foundation is broadband and then building up from there to connecting every single person at the end with what they need on this side. And healthcare and education are, are critical and key. 
Can you keep going? I'm sorry, I don't know who's controlling the slides. I don't have access. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about specifically, you know, the work that we're collectively doing in, in California. We have 177 locations that are on CTN representing 88 uh, organizations on the broadband network. Um, you know, we have a lot of clinics and stuff that are on um, our EHR Epic and then also NextGen. But really our work on the health center control network in partnership with the TRC is really where you're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of the needed support uh, they're using a lot of different EMRs. They, they need to know exactly how do I do this? How do I have a workflow? If provider now, she's working in her home <laughs> and her scheduler is working in, in her, his home, you know, how, how, what's the workflows to, to support how we're going to continue to see patients? How, how do we have the right equipment? How do I make sure that at my home I have enough broadband capacity because my kids are sitting in the other room doing online school? <laughs> How do I make sure that you know my my telehealth um, functionality is going to work? This is really how what we're always looking for. Um, we have a lot of different programs that we support on our EMR and technical system side, but I think again the true story is that we're helping support 3 million annual visits, 1.3 million patients, 500,000 plus Medi-Cal, um, 30% 30, 30 you know, of, our, of our visits um, overall across all of OCHIN. You know, people think OCHIN is, is just Oregon. We're in 47 states now, um, and, but 30% of our business is in California. 33 of our California groups are heavy on managed Medi-Cal. And again, the funding on the TRC, $325,000 a year. So what OCHIN does is really helps support the TRC through all the infrastructure support that we can give, marketing department, payroll, <laughs> You know all of those, all of those things. Uh, my business development team, my account management team, all of those, the T, the HCCN, all of all of that infrastructure is really going to help support Kathy and her team in the state of California. Can you, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Broadband invest, investments by the number, Sunny. You know this more than anybody. Here's your numbers. Today for this year, 1.65 million, that's net. So that's, a, that's your 65%, Sunny, from the FCC is coming in to help to support those 177 connections. 56% are rural, 157 endpoints clinics and 20, 20 endpoints of, of hospitals. Can you go to the next slide? Again, taking an EMR agnostic approach. Um, not everyone's on Epic, guys. <laughs> not everyone's on Epic. So, so it's really important to take an EMR agnostic uh, approach to our, to our work in California. So we continue to build improvement guides. Again, taking the patient and the provider in the heart of the thinking and how do we help build improvement guides so that they know what to do to get telehealth to provider and to patients. And our job is to be in the middle to connect those two. So again, that is broadband access. That is putting together, we've started putting together, we call clinic in a box. I'm gonna to talk to you about that in just a minute where that box, you know, Sunny, you're, you're, I like the smile. So Sunny, you know what I'm talking about here, right? It's actually, it's a box <laughs> and that patient can just open that box up and it is a couple of clicks and we have got them connected. So we can manage that their provider can manage diabetes, hypertension remotely in an easy manner. Can you go, can you go forward please? Thank you. 
I think a lot of people know that the FCC came out this year with that super speedy apply grant for, for telehealth equipment and devices. Um, we, we quickly jumped on that under CTN as, an, as consortium for the state of California uh, and then Ocean Broadband Network Services for the rest of the country. So we were lucky to get awarded $1 million for California and $1 million under Ocean Broadband Network Services. So in the state of California, uh, the $1 million, we uh, were able to provide uh, 11 organizations with, with that clinic in a box um, packet of devices. So we uh, sent out laptops, virtual at home uh, uh, clinic in a box, hypertension management kits, diabetes management kits, and also provided all the IT uh, support. We created a helpline for patients that they could call in to our network operations center and get direct feet, get direct support because no one wants a provider trying to help try <laughs> try to try to help a patient learn how to download Zoom. <laughs> you guys have got a lot going on. So so let's let's leverage all the technology and infrastructure and, and everything that we've got built and let's help those patients out directly. And that's what we've been doing. Can you go to the next so slide, please? Thank you. Uh, for California members, when we're talking, we're talking about, you know, the, the percentage of gross charges, talking about payment. You can see, you know, how dental went down, right, with, with the dental went down. So your, so your purple line on here uh, went down with a closure of the dental practices, which was so impactful, so impactful from a revenue side. Uh, especially our FQHCs and rural health centers didn't have the revenue to lose. Um, so, so, you know, we all have been, been struggling and dealing with that. Um, and, but on the flip side, the saving grace was telehealth. The saving grace was telehealth. And, and without everybody here on this call, um, and Sandy, I'm going to call you later. <laughs> Without everybody on this call, we could not have collectively moved to action. I mean, Ochin took a, we, almost zero, almost zero in March. Six weeks had over 58% of our visits virtually in six weeks. Mm -hmm. That was a hustle. And that was a hustle together. Because those clinics were putting providers out in their homes, kids were being sent home from school, you know, it was a, it was, it was a deal. Um, so it was only collectively that we were able to really save the revenue and also the access to care in in late March, early April, May. You keep going. Telehealth encounters in California continue to remain steady. We got to keep it that way, guys. Got to keep it that way. Actually, we should increase it. <laughs> so I'll let you guys read the numbers later because I don't want to, I, I, I want to make sure to give time. Um, so what we've learned so far is that the appetite for virtual care has increased. We've got to continue the ease of use. We've got to click, reduce down those clicks and get the technology to be easier and easier and access to technology. Got to make sure the reimbursement continues. We've got to make sure that broadband is everywhere. I have been in the car with Eric for years, driving. I think I've driven every endpoint of California, <laughs> riding shotgun. Um, and uh, we got work to do there still. And we got to make sure that people have access to interpreter services, support for additional language. Let, we got to make sure that that continues to, that, that, that barrier continues to get knocked down. Can you go to the next slide, please? Virtual care advocacy in California. I think I have Jen Stoll on the phone. Jen, are you on the phone? Or is she on mute? 
I, I, I know Jen Stoll, who's our VP of government relations, uh, just met in Sac with Sacramento folks yesterday. Uh, we, you know, we're a not, oh, there's Jen. Hi, everyone. We're a not-for-profit. So, you know, we don't have a lot of money in the space of GR and advocacy, but the money we have, we're putting it in California. So uh, it's really important to know that we're putting a little bit of money in Oregon, a little bit of money in Ohio and Texas, but we're putting most of our money in California. So important. So we're supporting, you know, the ability for providers to establish new patients via telehealth, the continual need for virtual, virtual care payment, uh, the avid we're continuing to advocate um, for that origination and distance site um, definitions, supporting the Medi-Cal payment, and ex continue to expand the funds and access to broadband. Can you go to the next slide? I call this the call for action together slide. <laughs> So we got to work together. Um, again, I said, I'm going to call you uh, because I, I, I really, you know, you and I have not connected a lot and I would really welcome the opportunity to do so um, uh, that together we're working uh, with everyone here, sustaining telehealth reimbursement, getting, getting broadband investments, tr provider training, patient engagement, patient portals, supporting the patients for these tools. I know Dr. Laura Miller from CHCN is on the phone, um, who is the lead chief medical officer for the CHCN network out of Oakland and Alameda, uh, and her and the chief medical officers and, and all the providers in the area. Uh, it's every day uh, we're working with them and a lot of other people across the state in order to not only adopt virtual care, but COVID, 19 testing, right? How, how do we continue to make sure, yep, oh, there's Dr. Laura Miller on the chat. Uh, how do we get through those complexities of uh, setting up the testing stations? Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a technical feat, guys, to, to do that. And uh, uh, together, it's only together that we're gonna be able to, to continue to have the, that support model available for uh, all people all people in the state. All right, I've talked enough. Uh, <laughs> no one wants to hear Kim talk a lot. Uh, what people want from Kim is action. That's and, all I really care about. Uh, Kim, what a, what a pleasure it is to connect this way again. Uh, know, thank buddy. you for the, for the journey down memory lane with David Harry and Tom Nesbitt and Eric Brown and uh, all of those early days. Um, yeah. And, and as you're riding shotgun in any car or if you're driving, you'll figure out California is a big damn state. And it takes a hell of a lot to actually uh, yeah. uh, reach every corner to tailor, uh, which we have to, our services to the community in language, in culture, as you just uh, uh, emphasized. Uh, so we will connect. I also really appreciate your dedication out of the attic uh, as a mom doing it. So uh, heartfelt work is always a uh, sole uh, investment uh, for a lifetime. So thank you. And I'm so thank glad. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> we're so glad that you were persuaded to join us. Uh, <laughs> and, and Kathy and Rebecca made that happen, Kim. So uh, again, um, we will expect you to be in California full time. Uh, or at least, uh, how about if I if I ask for sixty percent of your time? Uh, so well, if you if you saw my Alaska uh, trips, uh, I have been spending actually more than sixty percent over the last couple of years. Okay, good. I just <laughs> yeah. want to share in California, so you know uh, <laughs> we appreciate yeah. that very much. Well, I appreciate uh, you guys. It's, we it's, will it's, we will want to when we can actually have some impersonal okay. conversation by the way so keep that um uh, we also want to uh, issue that invitation and i think the Thank combination you. of what uh you said uh, the clinic in a box i laugh because or i smile because our board ordered us to do school to home in a box which we have but oh here, my gosh i'd love to hear know. more about that there is all of what we can write down, all of the lessons, uh, lessons learned that we can share, it still takes, 
institutionalized re leadership, an organization with a mission to support what people can do on their own. And that's why I wanted to say that the, the clinic in a box also needs that organizational support to optimize mm -hmm. what everyone can do on their own. And so that is something for all of us to keep in mind with all those excellent recommendations for what we need to do in California. And, and then turning to sort of a companion organization to CTN OCHIN is the center, thank you Kim, is the Center thank for Connected Health Policy. May Kong is the executive director uh, the Center for uh, Connected Health Policy was actually initially launched and endowed by the California Healthcare Foundation. I think Chris Perron is on and want to acknowledge that uh, Chris has been a party to this for a long, long time. And um, while that was established in California about the time that CTN was stood up with the FCC grant, it now also is a national center for connected health policy. And between uh, what you are hearing from Kim and you're going to hear from May, we now have a foundation of, of, of the data, the backdrop, and also I think a very good framing of, of recommendations that uh, need to not only become policy but become implemented actions. Um, and I'm mindful of the time when you're in a, um, if you're joining me for what I call a congregation, you understand it's a spiritual journey too and that I uh, may be slower than the rest of you, so I have to take the time to listen. And uh, we will get through all of this. Uh, we'll make it up somewhere, but I, I really want to be able to hear what our, um, all of our, our participants are saying. And so let me turn to May. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, May. And also, uh, she brings uh, a couple of dec decades, Dr. Uh, Kwong brings uh, quite a, 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 a resume of expertise and experience uh, to this conversation. Uh, Dr. May Kwong. Oh, thank you. And thank you for having me here today. Uh, next slide, please. I'm an attorney, have to always start off with a disclaimer. So any information I provide today is not to be considered legal advice, it's strictly for informational purposes. Um, also, if I happen to mention a company or show a product, know that neither I nor CCHP has any type of financial arrangement or relationship with such a company. Next slide, please. So a little bit of background about us, and, and Sunny did mention a couple of things. So we were established in 2009, actually, to be a California telehealth policy organization. We're a program underneath the Public Health Institute. But as was mentioned earlier, uh, we applied for a grant to be the National Telehealth Policy Resource Center. We're underneath the same grant program as the California Telehealth Resource Center. Um, there's actually 14 of us. We got our grant in 2012 and we've been serving in that capacity ever since. And I appreciate Kim's comments earlier because even though we're a national center, we still only get $325,000 a year. <laughs> so that was, um, we were very efficient in how we stretch our dollars, but that, that is like not a lot of money to cover the entire nation, both on the state and federal side of things. Um, but we also work with a variety of partners, both on the state and federal level, as mentioned, like the California Healthcare Foundation. We also work with AARP, uh, also with AMCHIP and ASTOS as well. And we're also the administrator of the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Center. So what that is, is the the telehealth resource centers who are underneath the same grant program as the California Telehealth Resource Center, CCHP, um, decided that we would get together and collaborate more closely. So we use those $325,000 funds that we each get more efficiently. So we collaborate on common projects just to erase duplication, to have a consistency of information that's sent out everywhere. And we are also the convener for the California Telehealth Policy Coalition, which I'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we do as the federal center is that we track all of the state Medicaid policies related to telehealth, the state laws related to telehealth, and the regulations related to telehealth. And we do that for all 50 states and the District of Columbia. That's a snapshot of our website. It's The information is publicly available. It's on an interactive map on our website. So if you're interested, say, in Texas, you can click on Texas and brings up all the information. We update this twice a year. We do a spring and a fall update. And 
and we just uh, released our fall update this year. So the information there has is good up through basically October 1st. Um, there is some COVID information in that report because anything that was made permanent that was a COVID change is in there, but we have the COVID information in a separate section of the website because a lot of that, those changes were temporary still on the federal and on the state level. So it's in, in a different section, but we keep both sides fairly updated, at least on the website. If you download the PDF report, that does get a little bit out of date quickly because it is a static report, but the website should give you the most recent information. Next slide, please. So this is a, a slide I like to use to give everybody sort of an overview of what happened during COVID with telehealth policy, both on the federal and the state level. Now, this is this is not even 20,000 foot level. This is probably 100,000 foot level. It's, it's very broad, very general, because there's a lot of nuances, a lot of detail in each of the policies. But what you can see is there were sort of common areas as to how they addressed policies and what policy changes were made. And a lot of that centered around reimbursement. It wasn't only reimbursement, but a lot of it was about reimbursement, what gets paid, what's covered. And the reason for that is because a lot of the established telehealth policies before COVID centered around reimbursement um, in Medicaid and Medicare and how commercial payers handled it. And that reimbursement policy is usually broken down into four common elements, um, which are you know, what services are covered, where the patient is located when the service is provided, who's the provider providing the service, and what's the modality in which to deliver the service. So that's why you see these commonalities between like what the state changed and what the federal um, uh, changes were centering around like those basic elements. And um, one of the things that I do want to point out that was a common change both on the federal and state level, but was a little unusual because before COVID-19, it wasn't really considered underneath the umbrella of telehealth or telemedicine, whatever term you want to use. And that's the use of audio only phone. So that was a change that was adopted both on the federal and the state level because of the fact people realizing not everyone's going to have access to telehealth, especially if they're staying, you know, at home for a variety of reasons, may not have a smartphone, may not have a laptop. And, and one big thing that I, is, is really important to everybody here, not have the connectivity for, for whatever reason, they, their rural area, they couldn't afford like, you know, a high speed connection. These are issues. How are they going to get services? we have to allow audio only phone, at least for something, in order for these people to receive health services if they're sheltering place. So this is sort of like the broad sort of landscape of the policy changes that were going on, both on the federal and the state level. And again, like I said, there's a lot of nuances in like how they were actually structured, but these were sort of the areas that they were covering. Next slide, please. So this is um, some of the data. So this, there's going to be a little bit of data here. And I, I will stress that this is all preliminary data. So this is data from CMS for primary care visits um, for fee-for-service for Medicare beneficiaries. And as you can see, the, the blue line on the bottom there are weekly telehealth visits, whereas the gray line is weekly in-person visits. And then the yellow line is sort of like, you know, the total visits there. And Basically, the telehealth policy relaxations on the federal level kicked in in March, and that's where you can kind of start seeing, you know, the, the telehealth increase and then like the in-person visits decrease. But, but roughly it was half the visits of all the visits that took place took place via telehealth at the height of height of like COVID at the very beginning. It starts to drop a little bit and that's that's for a variety of reasons because a lot of places were starting to open up again. People are feeling a bit more comfortable going into clinics and hospitals for their visits. So you do start seeing like a drop for telehealth as we look at the numbers going towards June. But this is the, re the result of you know, not only people sheltering in place, but opening up those policies for telehealth. So that's like kind of a snapshot that at least we have now at this moment of like what happened in the beginning of COVID and with the telehealth policy changes on the federal level. Next slide, please. Now, what was going on in California though? So before COVID-19, California actually policy-wise with telehealth was not in a bad place. They were definitely, uh, we were definitely far more advanced than what was going on with Medicare on the federal level and a lot of states because Medi-Cal actually expanded their telehealth policies the summer before, in summer 2019, they actually um, changed a lot, made significant changes, such as saying, 
basically we're going to cover all the services if you use telehealth as long as there's not some sort of in-person element to it we'll we'll cover it if we normally cover it underneath our program they clarified they said yes definitely the home can be an eligible originating site now there were still other things they weren't reimbursing for remote patient monitoring and also there were still limitations on how community health centers could use telehealth so it wasn't by any means perfect but it was a little bit more advanced than what other states were doing definitely more advanced than what was going on in medicare so even with this advanced policy when COVID 19 hit the state did have to make some adjustments did have to do some waivers did have to ask permissions to allow them to expand you know what was going to happen and how telehealth was going to be used next slide please so what were they doing? So some of the changes that they had to make was the phone. Again, before COVID-19, California was one of the states, telephone really wasn't considered sort of underneath the umbrella of telehealth. And it, it's still, I think you, if you talk to people, they may still have some, some questions about that. Um, but that was one thing that, you know, Medi-Cal had to do like everybody else was, we gotta allow phone to be used more, more prominently or more widely because people just don't have those services. And we work a lot with community health centers and we did hear that a lot from FQHCs and RHCs say, the people, our patients that we, we service, they don't have like a smartphone or the broadband we need to use a phone that's the only way they're going to get services so they had medical had to like do that expansion there um they also had to basically submit a waiver to the federal government to allow fqhcs and rhcs to to have a little bit more flexibility in how to use telehealth for those who aren't familiar with it community health centers like fqhcs and rhcs have very different types of rules that they have to abide by, which does not really match up well sometimes with the use utilization of telehealth. So special permissions, Medi-Cal felt they had to get special permissions to allow that to happen. Um, and, you know, and they service so many people on Medi-Cal, so that definitely needs to happen if that, that population was going to get services. And then there were other things that, um, you know, occurred as well, such as relaxing some of the consent and privacy requirements, things that we also saw on a national scale, what other states were doing, what the federal government was doing, um, and uh, allowing, uh, you know, requiring commercial health uh, plans to, to at least cover telehealth and assure parity. They, they were not required to do that until January 1st of next year because of legislation that was passed last year, AB 744. Um, Governor kind of like pushed that forward saying like during COVID, please, please do this. And I, I will say from at least anecdotally and talking with health plans and people's experience with health plans, a lot of health plans, commercial health plans really responded um, very promptly during COVID and, and especially where telehealth was concerned. Next slide, please. So what are we looking at for Medicaid data though? Uh, again, this is all preliminary, it's very snapshot. This came out from CMS, um, that's the link to the, the report and everything. So what we can see is like with what happened with Medicare, a huge increase in the use of telehealth and Medicaid programs. And as you can see, it's like February's way down there, pandemic hit, it spikes significantly. Uh, next slide, please. Interestingly, though, the group that they said used telehealth the most was really sort of the, the working age adults, like children were then the next um, sort of uh, grouping of like who was utilizing the most. And then seniors was actually what they were, were third, at least in the Medicaid program. So part of that may also be because they may have been having their coverage was by Medicare. So that could have impacted this data. Next slide, please. Now, you're probably wondering, why did I layer all these? Because if you if you look at it, you'll see that California is that light color, and that light color is like at the lowest end of the scale. So the reason for that, and we, we did double check on this, is because California's data is not reflected in all of this. They did not get their data into CMS in time when they were developing this report. So, so we're not quite certain what's going on with California and Medicaid because at least from this report, because they did not submit it in time for CMS when CMS was publishing it. So, so we're still not quite certain as to like how much utilization there was. I'm sure if like they, they, when they get their data in, we'll probably definitely at the very least be in the middle of the pack, if not like further along. Next slide, please. 
but we may have like a little bit of idea of what's going on. Again, this is not California only. Um, this is by an or entity called Fair Health. They have data from commercial payers and they divided it by region. So we're lumped in with like a bunch of other states here as well. But this is the data that they had at least for up until June or a snapshot of June. Again, not surprising, we see significant increases um, for, compared to like the previous year. Interestingly, on the urban and rural usage, uh, urban usage was up. Again, probably not surprising because this is like the first couple of months of COVID and COVID really hit the urban areas far more quickly than it did rural areas. So that's probably one of the reasons why there was like a little bit more there uh, than what was going on in rural areas. Next slide, please. Interestingly, these are like the most common sort of telehealth or uh, diagnosis that were used with telehealth. And it's flipped from what was in what we saw in June of 2019 compared to Ju June 2020. Again, part of the reason was because they've like expanded like what services that they would cover, but also, um, you know, more people were using it in, in, in for these different things than what they were before. Um, mental health, not surprisingly, like the biggest utilizer, like in, in both years. Um, but we saw other things that we weren't seeing last year, where it's being used in June of 2020, such as joint and soft tissue disease issues, um, general signs and symptoms probably related to COVID again. It's, so it's, it's really reacting to like what was the environment of, of that time. Next slide, please. And then um, the volume, oh, I think we went, but do we go backwards or maybe repeated it? So we'll just go to the next slide. This may give us a little bit of better idea. So these are, this is data that HRSA collects regarding community health centers and their utilization of telehealth. And it's a snapshot for a week. And, and it changes from weeks to week. So if you go to that link, it is a new map is put up every week. And I learned that it's, at least publicly not accessible at this time that you can't access like previous weeks. So I've been going there every week and like, you know, taking a snapshot just so I have like this record. But it's been consistent at least for the last couple of weeks that California for their community health centers definitely are on the higher end on telehealth utilization. So, so this may give us like a better idea of like what is going on in California, how much telehealth is being used, at least with the community health centers, we tend to be on the higher end in the nation on where it's being used. Next slide, please. So what does this all mean? I spent a lot of time talking about reimbursement, what's going on Medicaid. But that's not the only issue when you talk about telehealth and like how it's utilized. There's like a lot of other issues that have really, if you've been a telehealth person before COVID-19, they were always issues that we discussed, were always, you know, major things and said that these are things that we need to address. The conversation has really been elevated though now during COVID-19. Big one, broadband connectivity, because not only is it a matter of getting um, services to people, but there's also a question now of like, are we creating sort of a have and a have not type of situation here with low, those who have broadband, maybe they're a little bit more fluent or have like a higher income. You know, are we creating like a, a, a tiered system where they can have access, but like maybe like a lower income or people, people communities of color may not have as great of access to it. Licensing becoming, again, a huge issue before COVID-19, but really elevated in more prominence and attention, I think now. And one of the reasons I say that, um, so we're the policy center, we get a lot of calls from policymakers and I've gotten calls both on the federal and the state level from policymakers asking me about licensing and what has prompted that call is either a constituent, a staff member or the member itself is giving me the scenario or telling me the situation of my child came home from college and they can't now access student health and they were getting services there because they're not licensed. And it's like, well, going to depend on what state you're in. And if they didn't relax that licensing law, that's absolutely true. So that's why I say it's gotten more attention policy-wise is because policymakers, maybe it was kind of in the back of their mind, but it wasn't really an issue. There's a personal impact now, either to them, their staff member, or a constituent is, is like really bringing it up now. Um, education of providers and consumers. And this was something that at least CCHP has talked about a lot before COVID, but I don't think it it, it had a lot of traction or a lot of attention. Providers and consumers before COVID-19, providers may have been aware of telehealth, but they may not necessarily have been aware of the policies, like what was covered, what they could do. And consumers definitely 
were not aware of telehealth. I mean, I, I use my, my friends and families as barometer of like, you know, sort of um, Joe and Jane public. And before I've been doing this for 10 years and I still had friends and family members before COVID who didn't quite understand what I did for a living. And now they're, they, they understand they're like, oh, that, yeah, that telehealth stuff. Yeah. Okay. I understand what you do now. But I think that was very common for a lot of consumers. And that was also one of the reasons why telehealth may have lagged behind in, in like going forward before COVID-19, because you didn't really have that consumer demand asking to like, you know, utilize telehealth because they just didn't know about it. And then out of date forms and regulations. So I talked about like FQHCs and them having some type of rules on them that don't necessarily match up well with using telehealth just because those may have been rules that existed for years and telehealth wasn't considered when they built that. But we've also run into like out of date forms. So we, and, and Rebecca Picasso at CTRC can talk about this. We talked about this a couple of times and she brought this to me. Their skilled nursing facility was trying to, to do telehealth and they were saying like, oh, well, we're the originating site. So if you're an originating site, you get like a little fee. Medi-Cal will reimburse for that. Um, it, it's to cover like your expenses. It's not a lot, but, you know, it helps with the expenses. He said, there's not a place for me to put that on my form. So it's like, uh, well, okay, there what do you do? So I, I call, I actually call like the processing comp um, company that, Medi-Cal has engaged in order to to like process claims and everything and explain the situation to him saying what should I tell them and said well if it's not on the form then they don't get it I said but no the policy says they can get it they said but it's not on the form so <laughs> the and so I go back to DHCS and said hey in this form they're like yeah it's it's an old form we need to update that so it's even thing Uh, Are we having technical difficulties? Yes, sorry about that. Okay, Rosa is going to continue to try to, to do it um, and get May back. Oh, to be there, there we go. Okay, there we go. Ahead, go. So yeah, sorry. Yeah, my, my internet connection went a little unstable there. So so where do we stand? So a lot of the changes that we saw here in California in response to COVID, they're temporary. They, they are still temporary at this point. This last legislative session, they decided not to really do anything yet. Um, there were two bills related to telehealth that didn't make it to the governor's desk. He vetoed both of them. And in one of his, the veto messages for one of those bills, he says the DHS is currently in the process of evalu evaluating its global telehealth policies mm -hmm. to determine what temporary flexibility should be extended beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. So... So yeah, we have that. So that, that just tells me that 2021 is going to be an interesting year for telehealth policy in California um, because they've, they've essentially kind of kicked the can down the road. Um, and part of it is because the, the temporary changes in California are tied to the federal public health emergency. And they know that's a, at least been extended to the end of January. Um, if I were to guess... I think despite which administration gets in on the federal level, it's most likely going to be extended at least another 90 days in the beginning. So so they feel, probably feel they got some time. And California, I would say, is not unique in that position. I think a lot of other states are, are thinking the same way. Uh, we want to see how this general election shapes out. We're still doing evaluation. We've got some breathing room because the public health emergency has been extended. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the California Telehealth Policy Coalition. So this was actually established in 2011 and began with just a handful of, of groups who were monitoring a telehealth bill that was going through the process, the Telehealth Development Act. And, and that group was just saying, hey, can we just, you know, just keep, get updates on how that bill is going? And then when that bill passed, the group decided like, hey, we would still like to meet because the bill passed, but you want to see how it gets implemented. So it continued to meet and CCHP convenes that group and organizes and runs the group. And now uh, today we're, we're over 100 state and national organizations as members. So we meet monthly and we talk about, um, you know, what is going on in California. But over in the past two years, members decided that they wanted to be a bit more active with advocacy as far as the policy is concerned. Now, um, it, 
Ochen mentioned this. I am federally funded and grant funded for the most part, so I have to be, I myself have to be very careful, but we can act as like, you know, an educational partner, technical assistance partner, and our members can like put forward legislation and other members can decide whether to like support that or not. Um, so that has happened, like we have various members such as the California Medical Association, AARP California, uh, the Children's Partnership who are all involved and who are like, you know, strong advocates for telehealth and have put forward bills that they've sponsored. And the coalition has like assisted them with that. We also put out a lot of educational materials around telehealth for the state. And also we've done um, informa informational webinars and legislative briefings. We just had one last week that was very well attended um, and um, had like a good variety and mix of like uh, government officials, both from the legislature and different departments as well in the administration. Next slide, please. So these are some of the recommendations the coalition has has generated. They have not settled on their slate for 2021, but these are things that have come up. A lot of them have centered around like the temporary changes of like kind of keeping those permanent, but also areas that the temporary changes had not addressed that we think were still important that we've the coalition has always like advocated for. Like for example having Medi-Cal reimbursed for remote patient monitoring. So, so those, those different things that, you know, the, the coalition has pushed before COVID-19 are still going to probably remain on their agenda for 2021. But we, we shall see, we're actually meeting on November 17th for annual meeting just to finalize that final slate. Next slide, please. And these are just some links to the CCHP website um, that you can, uh, and some resources there. And next slide, and I think that is it. It is, and thank you, May, so much. Um, the briefing that you just provided, the information and what Kim provided is excellent information. And I just want to again acknowledge, I know we're behind. I uh, also, uh, wanted to say that all of the slides are going to be available because you're going to you know want to know that there was also background information that was uh, uh, provided for you that was generated by provided by CCRT uh, CTRC and the Center for Connected Health Policy and CTN and so and they're excellent and also uh, there is a letter that the uh, center and the, the policy uh, coalition sent to Governor Newsom in April that we also provided for you because it has great recommendations. What we're doing with this listening session is there will be a summary. We're recording it, but there also will be a written summary that will include all of the chat questions and answers to all of the chat questions as a part of the record uh, in addition to the slide. So just know that. And in recognition that we are going to try to um, efficiently catch up, what I want to do is ask our responders and also our panel members to fill in and build upon what you've heard from Kim and May, not repeat, but to add where there might be something that from your perspective and experience, we definitely need to capture and document for policymakers, for the legislature and uh, the governor, and also recommendations that you either want to reinforce or say, uh, uh, add something to that has not been yet put on the record by either Kim or May. So with that, we have two responders on this panel, June Simmons and then uh, Dr. Dorian Traub. I've introduced uh, June, but uh, uh, Dr. Traub, Dorian is on our board of directors a professor at uh, USC. And I will say, uh, May, that uh, Martha Escutia, who uh, also is a special counsel at USC and, and, a, and an executive has told us over and over again about the issue that you actually identify, which is students who go home because they're sent home. And now because of this glitch in the um, po policies and, and procedures, can't connect with their doctors for some other roles. Some things just didn't get fixed. And Barb uh, is so happy that you mentioned you're going to go take care of that form issue, get the state to change the form because to be consistent with the policy so that the skilled nursing facilities can actually get reimbursed. Um, so uh, I'm just for the record saying you've got that one. 
We're going to look for the solution. And Barb is going to make sure uh, you get it done because she asked me periodically, like, you know, once a week, do we have that form issue taken care of? So with that, um, June and then uh, Dr. Dorian Traub. Thank you. I appreciate the chance to respond to admiring this tremendous pioneering leadership and all the foundation that has been laid and impressed by the gap of where we need to go. We have a fulcrum. COVID has given us a fulcrum for change. It's made things highly visible. Um, it takes a village. So you're asking for a supplement and the two responders, uh, we're both uh, from social work. So we're representing the consumer base that you're trying to reach and gauge to do this. So I just want to note uh, that it seems like it'd be wonderful. Someone comes to us, gives us a new piece of equipment, shows us how to use it. We don't have to drive anymore. We're all hooked up and wow, what a wonderful thing, which it is. Uh, but uh, first of all, we have the fruits of systemic uh, institutional racism. These, these populations have been made more visible. Uh, we have people very much at risk in many, many ways. And some of the ways are that their level of trust in the system. Uh, I noticed in the chat, someone raised the question of privacy. Uh, we want to raise the question of choice. We want to raise the question of able, because many of these people are, no matter what age, because we, we serve across the lifespan, we can hear these are universal issues, rich and poor and at all ages for families and individuals. People have to be able, or have someone who is able to get eyes and ears in the home in the environment where people live, which is critical. This, we're trying to save the environment, uh, not driving, be more efficient, deal with workforce shortage, shortages that this can help with. But uh, we need people uh, on the receiving end who are willing, uh, who feel safe, uh, who can be engaged, uh, who are literate enough to uh, master a device. And um, to get them there, we may have to work through phones and phones have minute limits, especially for the poor. So texting doesn't require minutes. So we know, know that there are new ways of outreaching that we're utilizing, including drive by, talk from the porch, engage people. Uh, because I think, you know, trust, language, culture, literacy, health literacy, um, all these kinds of uh, features are part of what we need to address for full engagement of what we think is a village. And uh, we think that the consumer user for health purposes in telehealth is a member of their care team. And in a way it's very empowering to that role, which we think is so important, but uh, there is informed choice in this. and. Uh, many aspects. So as we build the infrastructure, as we equip the health system, uh, I think we really must engage in uh, the portion of our world that deals with uh, social conditions with uh, patient and person engagement. Uh, we have systems of care. So we have uh, the waivers, we have the nursing home diversions, we have the home and community-based alternatives, we have the community care transitions, assisted living, we have many outreach health homes, uh, many outreach forms. Uh, we have people who are in healthcare, so at least we can see they have needs, so we can identify who, who needs this, so the targeting can be done on healthcare. You still need to engage people. So we do a lot of that through all the agencies across the state that are part of the safety net in the street, in the home, uh, where the person is. So we're going out to catch them, uh, to persuade them that they should use healthcare, that access to healthcare is vital and that it's worth it uh, and that it's safe. So I think these are really important factors that we need. And, and so as I said in my opening comment, we are really interested in a full integration of social care and medical care. We see now a movement for that across the country. We see organizing of the home and community-based delivery systems. Now we have networks uh, that are statewide that involve many agencies. It can be accessed through a central point, a, a network lead entity. Uh, 
that we need to equip them for this work. And uh, they are very much a part of how we reach out and engage community health workers. We're training them. Blue Shield is putting them in uh, primary care practices as a test. You know, how do we access, how do we engage uh, and how do we really teach people to use these devices and make it worth it. So it isn't just, it, not just for healthcare. Healthcare is critical, but perhaps broader uses of connectivity and fun will be necessary uh, to make it so that people will be willing to not just open the box and put it on the table and walk away. So I think uh, really inspiring fantastic opportunity here for us to really change quality of life and health outcomes uh, by building these bridges, consumer, community service networks, healthcare, uh, and all this fantastic uh, policy, public support, and uh, technology expertise. So it's, it's a new village and uh, a wonderful one. So we're, we're excited that you're leading us. I'll Thank end you. there in the interest of time. <laughs> Thank you, June. Dorian. Thank you, Sunny, and thank you, June. Um, the two social workers following one another, of course, means that uh, we're going to probably say similar things. Um, so it's always always great to get to follow on the heels of somebody like June Simmons, who is just prolific in our field. Um, I myself am a social worker, but also do a lot of research in the field of telehealth. And so, of course, I want to echo what June said about expanding how we view uh, what telehealth is. We've spent a lot of time early in today's session talking about social determinants of health, which is, I like to tell my students, fancy code for poverty, inequality, and racism that appears in our physical functioning. And uh, if we're going to talk about that um, and try to address it through telehealth, it means expanding what we do in telehealth beyond standard medical provision and pulling in allied professionals around physical therapy, occupational therapy, behavioral health. We need to vastly expand the offerings for individuals to have comprehensive care using telehealth. Um, of course, in doing that, uh, and these wonderful advances that COVID have, has brought about around the idea of national and state expansion. And I agree fully with Barb around the idea of thinking through some ideas around national licensure for lots of professions. Uh, we also have to think about the fact that uh, by closing the digital divide, we don't create other clefts and other divides. If we are getting our care from national service providers, they may or may not be able to connect us with regional or local services that will support and uh, promote our health. And that those in very important uh, catchments and, and safety nets have to be also reinforced. Uh, what was very clear to me from all of our presenters is the vast level of underfunding in this country for telehealth services um, and telehealth uh, coordination. And that seriously needs to be addressed at all market levels. And then finally, um, because I, I, this is my own passion area, I'm a mother of two young children. Um, and because I know that CETF is as deeply invested in education as we are in health, I want to raise to the forefront, where are the children in all of this? What is happening around pediatric care uh, in, in the telehealth sector? We know pediatricians have historically been very, very reluctant to enter into the field of telehealth for many reasons. Um, and we need to be active in closing that divide because we are on the precipice of leaving an entire generation behind educationally and through their physical health and through their mental and emotional health. And that needs to be addressed uh, through our telehealth efforts. So I'm really excited about the rest of today and I wanna thank um, all all of the presenters and my um, colleagues at CETF because this is a very exciting opportunity. Thank you, Dorian. Thank you, June. Excellent uh, response comments giving us uh, exactly the, the filling in of where we need to um, elaborate and embroider on the recommendations that have already been presented. 
Uh, we're going to now turn to our panel from the primary care providers and community clinics. And we have four individuals from throughout California that have an immense amount of experience. We're actually going to start with a Sacramento Native American Health Center CEO, uh, Britta Guerrero, followed by uh, the Community Health Center Network in Alameda, Dr. Laura Miller, the CEO of the Open Door Community Health Center in uh, Eureka, uh, Troy, Dr. Troy Starr, uh, CEO Troy Starr, and then from Altamed, uh, the Health Services Corporation immense uh, network um, that Castro de la Rocha built. I uh, went to school with Castro de la Rocha and uh, here uh, and we'll have uh, uh, from Altamed, the Chief Government Affairs and Civic Engagement Officer, Bernice Nunez um, Constant. So let's start off with Britta from the Sacramento Native American Health Center. Good morning. Good morning. So um, when we were asked to present, um, we were asked to kind of give an update on what telehealth is looking like for us. And so in our health center, we're located in Midtown Sacramento. Um, we uh, offer all of the full primary care, dental, behavioral health, psychiatry, a multitude of specialty care. And when the pandemic hit, we did not have um, full telehealth capabilities. We had actually one exam room in the health center where we uh, provided telehealth. And usually that was limited to uh, specialties that were hard to access. So uh, child psychiatry, uh, dermatology, um, rheumatology, endocrinology, they were very difficult for us to um, find referrals for our patients. So we were using telehealth for a very limited number of services. And we were able within about 72 hours, believe it or not, um, move into a full service delivery via telehealth. So phone visits and using a Zoom platform um, we are using uh, two different systems. Uh, one is called Auto, um, and another one is called MedFusion, and both of those provide us um, interoperative access to our patients via um, patient portal, uh, a Zoom type product that is encrypted within our EHR, and then also being able to use uh, the Zoom link that we can either email or text to patients. So we had to set up the capabilities to document within the EHR, create uh, the medical assistant assessment template within the EHR, and then create a system for our providers to be able to do their visits within the EHR and make sure that we were handing off the patients electronically uh, from provider to provider and from reception to medical assistant to provider, all within this electronic format. I think what's been so beautiful about this process, um, and I wanna make sure that we actually don't lose um, kind of some of um, the wisdom that we've gained during the pandemic is that there have been some real positives and we have had um, flexibility and innovation that have happened at rapid speed where we thought EHR, or excuse me, um, telehealth uh, was going to take two years to implement and there were going to be all of these different types of red tape for us to um, get through and, and CMS approved the guidance very quickly. California um, was very quick to um, uh, implement uh, DHCS guidelines and we were moving very quickly uh, through the guidance with um, CPCA and testing claims every day to make sure that things were going through correctly. Uh, I think for our patients, um, we are a Native American health center located in an urban area. 
And so the majority of our patients are Native American and black and brown underserved. We have about 93% of our patients are dependent on Medi-Cal. Uh, we have about 60% of our patients with co-occurring disorders, meaning um, they're very high risk. Uh, we have many elder patients that we didn't want exposed to COVID. Uh, we had to make a lot of changes just on our intake for folks who did need to see um, a provider in person. But what's been so amazing is that we've removed all the barriers to care for our patients, um, transportation issues, child care issues, folks with anxiety disorders, behavioral health issues. They have been able to have their regular scheduled appointments. They've been able to get medication refills. Um, one of the things that we saw, I think, that was most astounding to me and in the FQHC environment, uh, we have a uh, no-show rate in our behavioral health department that's about 30%, which is the national standard. It's expected. Um, they ha have a tendency, tendency to be the patients who have the most issues arriving to their appointments, which we obviously understand. And we have a standby list for patients who are willing to um, get in and see whoever they can see. But we went from a 30% no-show rate in behavioral health and psychiatry providers to a 100% show rate. And we actually had to make modifications to our schedules so that our providers who were normally documenting during their no-show rates had changes where we were able to offer 30-minute appointments just for check-in. It took a lot of the lag time of check-in away and patients um, were able to do either a phone visit um, in that feeling of privacy, or they were able to do a face-to-face. -face. And um, one of the issues that patients reported with the face-to-face -face use of the Zoom link that we send via text or email uh, was that they were feeling a sense of anxiety or nervousness about a provider seeing their home. And so that's why they had actually opted for the phone version. And being able to offer that um, option for elder folks, too, who don't have um, the technology understanding or they don't have the familiarity with the usage, they were happy with the phone visits as well. We uh, have implemented a partnership with one of our local um, community health providers who was participating in the project room key. So patients who um, were at risk for COVID or, and they were unhoused or um, were migrant farm workers, they were able to uh, quarantine safely in a, a hotel or a motel room. And we were able to do phone visits and monitoring of those patients also. So patients who hadn't previously been established with us but were at risk uh, for COVID, um, had been exposed to COVID, or were positive for COVID, were able to be regularly monitored by our staff, um, which was another breakthrough for patients who had not been established with any medical provider. And the majority of cases they hadn't been seen in quite some time. And we've been able to maintain those relationships post the COVID exposure. So uh, I, what I, I don't want to lose in this process is the innovation, the flexibility. Um, it's been difficult. I think we've had to kind of stop on a dime and do a lot of pivoting and a lot of changing to make sure that patients felt connected. And as we are continuing to assess them, they're so satisfied with the services that we're offering um, that I think when we have to start having conversations about limits being put on these services that they have grown so accustomed to, uh, that's going to be a real hardship for us. We've continued to have conversations with the managed care plans, and they have said, you know, we're looking at ways to 
create an opportunity for folks who may be at higher risk or who may mm -hmm. require transportation assistance to continue um, with the telehealth related visits, but not knowing if it will be included in the state benefit plan is, is um, something I don't think we're ready to accept yet. We're uh, really wanting to make sure that this, main, this service is maintained for our patients. Uh, we have on average um, about five visits a year per patient, but with our behavioral health patients, obviously um, we see those patients at a, a much higher frequency. And to have a 100% show rate has just uh, in a time where patients are experience, experiencing isolation, depression, anxiety at um, higher rates, uh, being able to be there for them in this way has meant a lot to us and it has meant a lot to um, our patients. So our experience has been mostly positive. Oh, thank you so much, Britta. So let me just uh, repeat what I heard you say. Uh, you thought it was going to take two years and you did in three days. Now that's leadership and you had better results. And this testimony is very powerful. You also address the social uh, uh, issues that you heard from both June and Dorian. And there is this issue about what are people comfortable with doing in their home. But when you go from 30% no show to 100% show, uh, uh, that's really good. So uh, I appreciate it. I also want to say that um, this administration, the legislature, is very focused on climate change. We're doing a lot of work now with the Southern California Association of Governments of quantifying the reduction in ve vehicle miles traveled, they call them BMTs, mm -hmm. and greenhouse gas emissions uh, to improve the environment. Broadband is a green strategy, folks. Uh, it not a, and so we get a double bonus here. We're not impacting the environment. So thank you, Britta. And I thank you, Dr. Miller, for being patient and allowing us to flip. So we got Britta's firsthand experience of one little room to having all of this patient, uh, um, this patient care delivery uh, with the technology and obviously dedicated staff in a community clinic. So Dr. Miller is the head of the uh, Alameda County uh, 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 network of, of clinics. Now that includes La Clinica, which is one of the, the first uh, uh, on the scene. I worked with La Clinica back when Hallel was running it and founded it. And, uh, and uh, Jane Garcia uh, got you on the hook, so I thank her. And uh, at one point I ran the Tabricio the Vasquez Health Center. So uh, it's, it's dear to my heart. Thank you, uh, Dr. Miller, for being here. Sure, my absolute pleasure. Um, so I guess somebody's going to be advancing my slides. So I am here to talk to you about our, our telehealth experience within the eight federally qualified health centers that make up Community Health Center Network in Alameda County. Next slide. So this is just briefly who we are. Um, we are made up of eight federally qualified health centers. You can see them all below here. We have over 95 sites, over 270 thousand patients and over a million visits. Um, CHCM, Community Health Center Network, uh, is a managed care Medi-Cal services organization. So our members are the 67% that you see here in Medi-Cal, but our health centers see people from multiple different um, sources of insurance, including Medicare, private, and a large portion of uninsured folks. Um, you can also see that we're wildly diverse ethnically um, with a large proportion of Latinx patients, African-American, Asian, and we are primarily urban. So the rural um, experiences reflected earlier actually take me back to my very first two years of practice in Humboldt County um, on an Indian reservation, on the Hoopa reservation, but the vast majority of my clinical life has been in urban areas, this one right here. Uh, next slide, please. So with regards to telehealth, I'm really singing the same song that others have. We turned on a dime in, you know, March 17th, 2020 will be forever burned in my memory as the day that Alameda County and many of the Bay Area counties went into shelter in place. 
um, literally the weekend before the weekend after multiple weekends, providers were on Zoom calls figuring it out. Um, what would we do? What would our templates be? How would we manage um, all the things that we needed to do to keep providers and patients safe? to do inpatient care, in-person care for those who needed it, but have everybody else at home as much as possible. Um, one of the, so this is a graph here of claims data. Um, we are rich in claims data. And so you can see the gray bars are um, non-telehealth. And this is the week of March 8th, um, the bar that's mostly gray. And then you can see uh, moving forward from middle of March, there's just this explosion of telehealth. Um, and interestingly, as time goes by, there's pretty much a, a stabilization of the kinds of telehealth um, encounters that we have. I think really that's just reflecting sort of a diversity of experience and people flinging codes because they didn't know what to do, but they were just taking care of patients. Um, we process claims for our specialty network as well. And, and before I flip to the slide, I want you just to focus on both how green we got, how quickly, and really how pretty much we recovered the, the height of our columns pretty quickly, and that's a uh, visit count. So on the next slide, you can see claims for our specialty network. So tiny little bits of telehealth, um, not really a lot of change and lots and lots and lots of in-person care. So primary care, I think, is quite um, uh, well suited to telephonic, and we really, really did it. Um, and, and indeed, with specialty network, it has not come up to the volumes that we've been able to come up to. Next slide, please. And so in terms of technologies and practices, I think the, the real answer is multiple. Um, we, several people have responded to the whole COVID um, environment for us as the Wild West. It is the Wild West of testing. It is the Wild West of modalities. Um, a lot of us are still on audio only. And I think that's really important to say. Um, so how we do it, some people are using Doximity Dialer which is an app on your phone that actually sent you, a provider uses their personal cell phone, but the number goes out to the patient as the clinic phone number. Um, some of our health centers purchased iPhones so that they could do FaceTime with patients um, and protect, essentially protect the personal cell phone number of the provider. Um, we do have some doing video. It's not nearly as much as I would like, um, you can do Doximity Dialer on video. It sends a link, uh, a text link to the patient. Uh, we are with Ochin for Epic and uh, one can do Zoom through Ochin Epic MyChart. It is a little cumbersome. And again, as I mentioned, some of the clinics uh, bought iPhones such that their providers could do FaceTime. Because FaceTime is so very accessible, elders are used to doing it for their grandchildren. This has been a really um, important modality for people. Next slide. So in terms of uses, um, multiple, various, incredibly important. Um, our prime, as I said before, our primary care visit numbers are only slightly lower than shelter in place. So we are absolutely keeping care going. Uh, someone mentioned earlier, one of the initial um, deep desires of primary care was to keep people out of the ERs and hospitals, to keep providing primary care such that our patients could stay at home um, and not overwhelm hospitals. In September, across our network, 61% of our va uh, visits were via telehealth, and we know that through claims. One of our member clinics, Lifelong Medical Care, did a survey of respondents um, a survey of telehealth uh, users, 81% were satisfied with telehealth. And of those who responded, 40% were over 65. So we need not underestimate our elders. Um, they can do it. Mine can do it. Um, I have a primarily geriatric patient population and we, a lot of times we got this. Um, and as was said prior, this incredibly reduced no-show rate, both for primary care and for behavioral health. Um, the same thing that uh, Britta mentioned, 
we've had to do changes in the behavioral health schedule because the BH providers used to have to rely on no-shows to catch up. And now we need to figure out other ways to keep the BH providers from completely burning out. Um, next slide, please. And so barriers. Um, not everybody, patients and providers are comfortable with technology. Access to stable Wi-Fi. I mean, clearly this is what um, this group has been working on for so long. I mean, I've had video calls with pixelated elders that freeze and we both freeze and it's, it's really hard. Um, not everybody has access to devices. And for our non-English speakers, this is incredibly challenging. If you need translation, um, you have to get a translator, a patient and a provider all on the same audio call. And getting that for video is even more challenging. One of the main uh, translation companies that is uh, given to us by one of our managed care plans, only very recently after much gnashing of teeth has been able to get uh, three-way translation on video calls. Um, oops, I'm sorry. Okay, what, what, forward? Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, yes, and then um, this also was echoed prior, lack of privacy in the home. Uh, people may not be willing to speak about behavioral health issues or issues of interpersonal violence if they can't find a private and safe space in the home. Um, some people are embarrassed about what their home may look like. On the flip side, actually seeing the home and seeing the medicine cabinet and the piles of pill bottles can be incredibly illustrative, but we do really have to think about that privacy issue. Next slide. Um, so action steps. We need to absolutely optimize connected devices. I frankly, as a primary care provider, am very worried about the strokes that are coming down the road at us. Um, even just getting blood pressure cuffs in the home has been a huge challenge, much less than being connected. So really a huge challenge there. Um, making FaceTime HIPAA compliant. Uh, that was a shout out from our group at Asian Health Services because FaceTime really is very accessible, uh, especially for the elders that they care for. We need to integrate devices into the EHR. I, I have yet to see this um, and it needs to happen. Zoom via MyChart has been challenging. Um, it's getting a little less clunky, but um, definitely challenging. And one of the things that, that has been beautiful to hear throughout this whole conversation is this real need for advocacy to continue to reimburse visits, telehealth visits in the FQHC setting. As a provider, I look forward to the day that I don't have to see everybody. Uh, via telehealth, there is still a role for hands-on and the physical exam, but we have to keep a balance. I would say that for me as a primary care internist, a good half of, half to three quarters of what I do could be handled uh, purely by a telehealth. And then again, I'm preaching to the choir, but erasing the digital divide. Absolutely important. Next slide. And the last thing is, um, and some have mentioned this in, in regards to the structural barriers. Um, again, we are seeing greater show rates in part because it minimizes the economic burden of taking time off of work and transportation. Um, I definitely have patients that have to take three buses to see me and I would so much rather they stay home um, if I don't need to see them, not take time off work and you know, not have to uh, deal with all the transportation challenges. So that is it for me. And um, this has been a really excellent conversation. I appreciate the ability to um, speak from our truth in Alameda County. Uh, thank you, Laura, for representing the clinics and compiling all of their experiences into very compelling data and graphs. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Miller referenced the Hoopa Reservation, so that's one of 109 federally recognized tribes in California. California has more Native Americans than any other state. Uh, there are other tribes that aren't federally recognized, so just understand the diversity of our Native California population. 
Um, and if you were serving Hoopa, you were probably serving some of the family members of Dave Riesling that- uh, Absolutely. Were, uh, that, oh. that I work with very closely on Native American studies in California, so. Absolutely. And it came from Humboldt County, which is where Open Door started. And uh, I, God rest the soul of Herman Spetzler, who uh, is a longtime pioneer. And uh, Tori Starr is the CEO because Kathy, Moxon and uh, and uh, Connie Stewart made you come, and and it's in and we're just never below uh, calling on all of our friends to make people show up. So thank you, uh, Tori, the the new CEO at Open Door. We have to unmute mute CEO Star. Hey, there we go. All right, I, I'm allowed to be unmuted. Thank you very much uh, for um, letting us participate today. Um, I appreciate it very much. And uh, Hoopa actually is uh, the Hoopa Valley and the Hoopa Reservation are within the realm of where we serve. Um, I'm going to share my screen, I hope. And I have uh, modified um, my um, thoughts on this um, based upon all the great input that everybody has provided um, so far. And it's been incredibly rewarding. So I'm delighted to be invited. Um, a little bit about Open Door. We actually serve the two farthest northwestern counties in California. So that ends up being an area the size of Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Delaware combined. Um, we have 12 clinic sites. Um, we serve uh, about 60,000 unduplicated patients, 300,000 visits a year. Um, we have become um, the uh, largest provider of OB or pretty much only the only provider of OB services just because of how things have progressed in the rural areas and the closing of private practices and that. Um, and then we're fairly unique for an FQHC because we serve a really um, diverse population from a payer mix standpoint because we are the largest provider of primary care in these two counties. So only 56% of our population is actually um, the Medi-Cal population, we serve 20% Medicare and 20% private. So we have a wide, diverse uh, population, which is representative of our county. Um, so what I wanted to do is take some time, um, since I had the opportunity, um, and I promised Connie that I would do this, um, that um, to talk about the rural perspective. Um, and, you know, we have some unique challenges. Actually, Kim did a really nice job about talking about some of the things that occur in the rural areas and just wanted to share a little bit about that. We are, you know, definitely living in the time of the dinosaur, meaning that if you're not big, you're not really able to participate effectively in a lot of things in our country. And so OCHIN has been really helpful for us um, and their ability so to participate in a collaborative network of folks that are using an EMR platform has been really helpful for us. And it actually has helped accelerate our, our ability to make that transition into really trying to do video care from that. And then, you know, I, I really appreciate what May said because, you know, policy essentially either creates barriers or removes them. And then it also drives funding. And really people do what they get rewarded for. So we've had this kind of, um, I think, uh, archaic system of making people come to a clinic to get care. And that's because that's the only way you could get paid to do it, right? But if you look about it from a person's standpoint, um, how they live their life, coming into a clinic is not the most convenient thing or the most efficient thing. And from a business standpoint, having to have people take so much time off work doesn't make sense. So I think the whole thing around video care is just is wonderful. And for a rural area, it gives us an opportunity to expand people's access to care like no other thing could be possible. It removes so many barriers that people have, whether it be from a transportation or an economic standpoint, or just the ability to um, organize themselves to even get in. So, and, I, and in the bigger picture, ha having the ability to do telehealth is the only way that we'll ever really be able to do population health management. So I think we now have a really vital tool in our toolbox that we have to learn how to use more effectively but that tool is incredibly important. The rural areas, as you know, we just have issues with distance, right? And so for one of the big things, and I served on the Economic Development Court, uh, Council for the Northern Counties, broadband access is an enormous deal. So the literal pipes is just, you know, we have so many places that people just can't even get to the pipes, let alone 
once they get to the pipes, can they pay for the pipes? So, I mean, there's a whole lot of barriers, but overall, we certainly need to keep pushing for that. Um, and then just people's ability to work with the technology or get access to the technology is challenging in a rural area. And then we have, because we have such a large senior population, um, people learning how to use the technology takes time, energy, and resources to help people get to that point to be able to do it. So it's, it's an investment, it's kind of a long-term investment. And we're, and we're recognizing that like health plans who bring new members on, when we bring new people into our clinics now, we really have to have as part of their onboarding the time and effort to teach them how to use the technology in order for them to be able to interface with us better. So that's a unique new cost that we have to incorporate into what we're doing, but it's a worthwhile thing overall to be able to do it. And then of course, you know, money, access to funding is always gonna be a key thing for the rural areas. And the rural areas in particular, trying to come back from the COVID economy, our access to capital is going to be crucial and it's going to be really difficult to actually be able to achieve that. I wanted to um, share with you a little bit um, about the project that we actually have done to really truly convert from telephone care to video care. So it's been interesting, our uh, lexicon around this whole process of telehealth, we've had to really define what does that actually mean for us. Um, <clears throat> so this is a graph that we actually use to track what type of visits that we've made. So as you can see, the blue is the in-person visit, and then you can clearly see when COVID hit. And like all good healthcare providers who are, are firefighters at heart, right, so we'll run to the fire and figure out how to make it work and all that kind of thing. But and everybody patted themselves on the back because within one week we had almost got our visits back up to normal, but they were all telephone. We didn't really do telehealth. We just switched to the telephone, right? And, and there's certain limitations to only using a phone. It can be very appropriate in, uh, in many ways. And so we started tracking the green in this graph is when we started really tracking our video visits to be able to tell the difference between telephone and video visits. And as you can see, as time has gone on, we're seeing more people in person, the pediatric folks and those kind of things. Um, and we really have put a concentrated effort. So we did a whole performance improvement process and we're continuing to do it because um, I wanna reiterate, change doesn't happen quick. People may think that through crisis, you can actually get something done and you can, but how do you create that to be a sustainable platform? So we have a whole process that I was gonna go over and I won't go over now, but I want you to know that it takes a lot of organizational energy and effort to make giant conversions to like video care. And so we are doing that because we recognize the importance of it because I'm an old home health nurse and I know the value of seeing somebody in their home is really important. Um, and so you get some of that through a video care. Right. And so the importance of having the ability when people are willing to do it is really important. And the quality, I think, of the visit is definitely enhanced by doing video care. So we've put a lot of time and energy into making that happen. And I want to just kind of share a little bit about that. And so we didn't just sit back and say, hey, we did great. We transitioned to this, you know, whole telehealth. No, we haven't. And so we really want to have a long term focus on how do we use this tool in our delivery platform? Because we don't know how many, what is it gonna look like when COVID's over, right? So we're trying to think population health, what are we gonna look like in a year? What are we gonna look like in two years? How will this tool be able to help our populations be able to be served better from that standpoint? And so um, we track uh, by each site and by each service line that we have, how many visits are done by each way. And we share this weekly with our team so that they're aware of the progress that they're making and trying to be able to identify what are the barriers and the next steps to being able to move to that level that we're really doing primarily video care. You know, if you don't have data, you can't really be able to change anything. And so a lot of places struggle with data. We're fortunate to have a business intelligence group within that we have created and that's helping us to do this. Wow. So we had a goal that by October 31st, 50% of all of our virtual visits would actually be video visits. And so we've put a lot of time and effort into that. And I just pulled you up to see what the structure 
that we had to put into place to make this happen. And it's still ongoing, right? And so I, you know, I'm overseeing this, but I have people and we had to hire a project manager just to try to be able to get to make this happen. So the resources that it takes for a health center to do something, we're kind of unique because we have 12 sites. So trying to spread over 12 sites, it gets to be challenging. So trying to put this level of um, effort and detail and structure and process is really important. And you can see in the white line, those ongoing work groups are all the areas that people have talked about and, and those won't go away, right? Um, and fortunately, there's been COVID funding to do things like equipment and some of that stuff and those kind of things. But ongoing, how are we going to be able to do that? And then, you know, training takes time. You know, people don't convert right away. Um, I still have providers that refuse to do video visits, right? You know, they and so that work that we have to do to help our workforce really adapt um, is a long term effort. So. Um, how do you support that? How do you make that work? So we have all of these things and, and the work with our patients in particular is really rewarding, but that also takes a lot more effort to make sure they can participate more fully. Our experience like uh, Britis has been, boy, from behavioral health standpoint, this has been just wonderful. I mean, our no-show rate has gone down, but then again, you get the, the other flip side of that is now our providers are getting burned out, right? So, so all of this that also comes into play is we're looking at how do we manage a workforce? We flipped so much of our workforce to working from home that they had never worked from home before. How do you do that? How do you manage them? How do you support them? How do you do all of those things? So um, we weren't a remote working company and now we've become a remote working company. And so that's some long-term things to look at too. So I think other, other folks, those kind of um, operational challenges are something that we'll need, uh, we will continue to look at. Um, but overall, we are just really excited about this. I, we think this is a wonderful thing. Um, we do not want it to stop, but we are certainly gonna need to have continued support and resources in order to make it happen. So thank you. I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, thank you, Tori. That was excellent uh, in terms of uh, both the, the framework that you put out, and I know you are editing on the fly to take out lots of information. You did a great job. We appreciate it. However, I do want to assure everybody that the full presentation will be made available. So you're not going to miss it with people who are editing. You're going to get everything. So uh, a masterful job uh, of, of uh, really modifying, as I just said, Tori. Um, so thank you and um, uh, say hi to all of our friends in, in Humboldt County and Del Norte. Um, turning now to uh, Southern California and as I said, the immense network of uh, at least 43 clinics as I last counted, uh, Bernice, uh, uh, for Altamed is their uh, VP who handles all these external affairs. So uh, Berenice Nunez Constant, thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks everyone. Um, so I'm just gonna try to pick up on some of the things that uh, my colleagues have mentioned already, but also just share a bit about, you know, our, our footprint. You're absolutely right um, that we are one of the largest federally qualified health centers in the nation. We have about 300,000 patients that we have the privilege of caring for in Los Angeles and Orange County. And as you can imagine, when this COVID-19 pandemic hit here in the area, I mean, it's been, it was just such a logistic uh, hurdle and challenge, but we knew that um, telemedicine and telehealth would be the huge opportunity. I mean, the collective we. Um, early on, we were also involved in conversations with um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. In fact, specifically Eric Hargan, the Deputy Secretary, and he said to us, "You know, um, we got to focus on the silver linings. And if this pandemic is doing anything, it is accelerating innovation." Uh, he actually said to us um, on the telehealth front, I think we've moved forward in a matter of a few days. Uh, we moved forward about seven years, and so. That was an amazing thing that has stuck with me. Um, with that as well, you know, it, it is absolutely true that even the larger uh, systems like ourselves um, have had that challenge of, yes, we're providing these telehealth visits, but the infrastructure and building the infrastructure 
um, and sustaining it has been truly immense. And uh, and we as a larger system have the ability to, to put this infrastructure in place. Um, I think that what I wanna share with you all is that my latest numbers from March 15th to October 15th um, is that we've done about 315,000 visits via telehealth. But again, absolutely true that they're mainly un, uh, telephonic visits. About 290 of those have been um, telephonic and at about 25,000 or so are true video visits. And so I think that's just really telling a very, of a lot of different things. I'm seeing in the comments that, you know, part of it is true access and training for these types of modalities. We are all about, especially on the FQHC front, meeting our patients where they are. In LA, as you know, we we serve, one of our biggest footprints is in Southeast Los Angeles that um, unfortunately uh, is the epicenter for the coronavirus for the Latino community. We ultimate serve over 85% Latino patients. And so we, are, we were in the thick of it. We are in the thick of it. And so what we're finding is a lot of what my colleagues have mentioned. Folks, um, you know, being hesitant to join on video, not knowing how to join on video, um, issues with broadband. Maybe they're taking, um, maybe they're having their their office visit or their uh, physician visit at work, um, and they don't have the privacy and space to really be able to um, have conversations. The same is true in their home, etc. And so, I want to frame this my comments as well with the frame of health equity. It's interesting, um, and I think we all know this, but I think just as a reminder, you know, us that have the privilege of having uh, private health insurance or employer-sponsored care have had access to telemedicine and telehealth for many years. What's new here is that now finally, um, Medi-Cal patients and, and FQHCs have the ability to provide this new technology new technology to um, our patients. And so I, I just, I keep, you know, uh, underscoring um, that this is, you know, truly a health equity conversation and we have to make sure that our patients truly have the access. Um, I also wanted to share with you all the platform that we are using is Doximity and we also have Epic and we use vid video, B-I-D-Y-O. Um, and though those platforms have been successful for us, of course, there's a ton of growing pains. Um, and our, our, we're at about a 50% or so uh, rate for our total visits, you know, 50% in person. And so another, th another thing that I heard from my colleagues was that, you know, Telehealth is absolutely amazing and we need to sustain it because it is the new normal. So I was really happy to hear Fig say, you know, that there is a commitment there uh, for, th for this because we have to figure out the um, payment component to sustain it. And it is a comprehensive service that we are providing because you still need a physician, you need the infrastructure. Um, and, you know, we need some help to to sustain what we've already built, but there are, I mean, need for um, in-person visits as well, right? There's, you know, I'm just looking at our numbers and, you know, pediatrics, right? Folk, kids need to come in for their immunizations and their primary care. We have um, uh, OB uh, uh, gynecology and pregnant women, optometry. There's, you know, dental services that have to be provided in person. And so, you know, there's going to be just a really important, we, I think for us, it's about, you know, making sure that absolutely we, we want telehealth and we want to support that. We need it, actually. Um, we need to uh, focus on training our communities on using the technology, making sure that they can truly access it. And then um, also keeping in, in, I think, in the forefront that, you know, we are healthcare providers. So there's a very uh, real human component to what uh, we are providing every single day. And so, um, you know, I'm excited for the work ahead. And it really, I mean, everybody here, I mean, I'm learning, you know, we, we think we're ahead of the curve here until we hear, hear other folks and, and, and we are just continuously learning. So I appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak with you all today. Thank you, Berenice. And it's not lost on FIG that you all are here. So, uh, and reminding uh, uh, the administration and the legislature that uh, there is you know, this community of practitioners who are very committed. You use the word health equity. I want to say we talk about digital equity 
because it is about equity. And as Jim Simmons says, we're very mindful that the economic disparities, the economic segregation in our communities are rooted in institutionalized racism, that there is a whole lot that we need to address. Uh, that goes beyond technology and technology is only a tool. So we can't do much with that tool if we don't understand everything else. And as Jim Kirkland said, from our perspective, digital access is a 21st century civil right. And access delayed is access denied. And, and we're into this whole equity, this quest for equity. So thank you for that, that reminder. You mentioned Southeast, uh, you know, Los Angeles. I just also want to do a shout out to uh, the Southeast Community Development uh, Corporation that is actually one of our key partners with, um, with Cesar, Salvador, Mott, and, and Emma Hernandez. So we've got uh, people who can help connect your patients uh, to uh, technology at home. We, we want to uh, continue what uh, I know that, um, that Richard Polanco and Marisa Canche have been uh, trying to, to facilitate that under the leadership of our, of our VP, Susan Walter. So thank you, Berenice. Um, I also want to remind everybody again, chat, do it. Uh, Martha Van Royen reminded me, she leads up the Inland Empire Regional Con Consortium. So uh, thank you, uh, Martha, for that reminder. And now we're going to turn to our responders to our primary care panel. Yes, I know we're still a little bit behind, but this is too rich a conversation. Uh, you can just blame me, everybody does, so I just take full responsibility. Uh, and um, we have first Kara Carter from the California Healthcare Foundation. Uh, Dr. Sandra Hernandez is the CEO there, was health officer in San Francisco, and I first started working with uh, Dr. Hernandez. So we have, we're delighted to have Kara join us uh, to respond. Good morning, thank you everybody. Um, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am the Senior Vice President for Programs at CHCF. And for those who don't know, CHCF has been uh, committed to telehealth and expanding telehealth in California for more than the last 10 years. Uh, I would observe that over the last few months, which have been a very dark time for many, including myself, one of the bright spots has been to watch the very rapid adoption of telehealth and innovation in this space. Um, and it's been really fascinating for me to listen to all of the presenters today, both the broad presenters in the morning, and I want to just really extend my gratitude and thank you to all of the clinics uh, who are at the front lines of making this transition happen for our patients. One of the things that CHCF has done in the last few months to try to support this work is uh, we've awarded six and a half million dollars to over 50 organizations to try to promote and further telehealth, something that we're very proud of. And I've heard a number of themes from folks this morning that really resonated strongly with me, particularly around uptake and um, engagement and no-show rates and how important this, this lifeline is for Californians as they, you know, as they've made their way through the pandemic. Uh, you know, one thing that I can offer to complement some of the data that we've heard this morning, we did a survey of Californians that was recently released with a segmentation by low-income Californians about their experience of care, and specifically their experience of care in the last few months. And actually, I found the responses quite, quite astounding. So two-thirds of Californians, both low-income and not low-income Californians, reported engaging in telehealth or telehealth visits in the last few months. And of those, two thirds reported a good experience, uh, which I actually found quite amazing. And the last of those statistics I'd offer is that when you doubled down and you looked at people of color to the point on health equity that was raised, three quarters of people of color reported a good experience with telehealth. And two thirds of those said they would choose a telehealth visit over an in-person visit given the option. I just, to me, that really speaks to how important this is. I would say shame on us for taking 10 years in a pandemic to get there, to deliver something that is so needed in our communities. Um, I would offer three barriers that I've heard consistently both today and, uh, you know, over the past many years, and then three recommendations to, to um, stakeholders and decision makers. So the barriers, which I think we've we've heard. So you know, first off, first and foremost, any patient barriers that still exist must be overcome. So access to broadband, access to video technology, a private space from which to take a visit. Secondly, the uncertainty that remains over the future of reimbursement must be addressed. 
We, we simply have got to address this. We have made huge strides by creating space for new reimbursement models, by allowing people to access telehealth in their homes, by telephone, and by uh, allow, allowing our clinics to establish new patients in this mode, mode. We have got to be able to continue that to create a sustainable uh, modality. And thirdly, something I haven't heard as much of this morning, but I do want to really rise up, is we have to find ways to get tools into patient homes. Mm -hmm. uh, and by that, I don't just mean telehealth tools. I also mean remote patient monitoring tools, things that will allow our clinics to really drive home some of the improvements that we've seen. So that's things like digital thermometers and pulse oximeters and blood pressure monitors. We have to find a way to really lift up and support that. So the recommendations I'd offer are three. So first and foremost is payment. And we've already talked about that. I'm not going to go on about it, but it is really, you know, what gets, what gets measured, what gets done and what gets paid gets done even more. And so we have to find a way to expand this, the, the payment environment that we have. Um, the second, which I think won't be surprising to anyone here, is that the state must find a way to set policy to ensure broadband access for Californians, rural and urban. Uh, not, the pandemic has lifted up this like nothing else has. And the third, which um, I haven't heard anyone mention and is a very CHCF perspective is, I feel like the state, this is the time to monitor the use of telehealth. I mean, we are hearing all of these wonderful anecdotes. We see data that's coming out in pieces. Every clinic that we've heard from has their own data about the uptake and use of, of this technology, the decrease in no-show rates, et cetera. We really need a broad monitoring of this to understand across payers, particularly the public payers, what is happening. Um, and we need to be able to adopt policies and practices should there be ongoing disparities that persist in access. We have to be able to adopt policies and practices to address those. So that is what I would offer. Again, with a huge thank you to presenters today and a thank you um, for having us here. Um, we continue to stand by ready to support this effort in future years. Excellent, Cara. Three barriers, three uh, recommendations. Very, very helpful. Appreciate that very much. Uh, and the measuring of uh, to monitor to be a continuous uh, feedback loop into improving uh, the care actually for patients. Uh, great, thank you. And uh, from the California Primary Care um, Association, Andy Martinez uh, uh, Patterson is here to, to again address this. Thank you, Andy. Sure, so I'm gonna make it quick and I'm just, I think my central recommendation is payment. Um, the reason we haven't had telehealth was because of myopic feelings about payment and that there was less value to a telephonic, to a telehealth visit. Anyone who is a Kaiser patient, who is a mother, who has had nervousness in the middle of the night with a fever with a baby, anybody who's called up that nurse advice line knows that telehealth, one, does a lot for mental health just to ease your anxiety, but two, it avoids multiple hospital visits unnecessary in the middle of the night. It does a thousand things. And we have limited that to Medi-Cal to our most vulnerable patients because we don't value it as much or we don't trust providers as much. I hope we do not repeat the mistakes of the past. I hope we do not lessen the payment or downscale the payment for telehealth because it is less valuable. The value that it brings to a patient community, to a mother, to a father, to a family, to not have to jump in the car, to not lose money, for all of that, is as equal to seeing a, a patient or a provider face-to-face -face for 15 minutes. Uh, we have to change how we think about value, and we have to fundamentally change how we pay for healthcare. We can't keep paying for tele, I don't, I'm not, I'm, I am advocating that we pay full payment for telehealth and telephonic uh, visits, but we need to move to a different payment model altogether because the fee-for-service model only incentivizes providers to see patients when they are sick. We need to flip it on its head and we need to incentivize all people to be as healthy as possible and to be reimbursed for that extra amount of work. And that's, um, you know, we're working on that with the state alternative payment methodology for FQHCs. You know, there's other providers out there who need different methodologies. And for our health centers out there who I know who still remain a little bit hesitant about flipping over the whole payment model. You turned over your delivery model in three days. I know you can turn over and you can handle the new payment and we will unleash creativity and a new frame of equity for California when we change payment models and we start trusting our providers to know what's best for their communities 
and all the staff and using a whole new array of staff and community health workers and promotoras, nurses, case management, we can just do this so much better. And COVID really showed us that we have to. We don't really have a choice anymore. So I hope that we we take this call and we're passionate about it and we do it together. Thanks, Sonny. Thank you, Andy, and thank you for framing it in terms of the whole change in the reimbursement model with the incentives for healthy behavior. Um, and your members have pretty eloquently today given us all of the evidence that some of us were using limited data, limited pilots to do, and it's amazing what has happened. Um, so thank you. Uh, we're going to turn to from the clinics to skilled nursing facilities and the whole realm of assisted living for seniors with this next panel. And I do want to just acknowledge and thank the California Emerging Technology Fund Board for putting up uh, very precious dollars. Uh, Rich Mata, our, our treasurer CFO, always reminds us. Uh, but um, actually, uh, Barb Johnson convinced them all we're going to do a pilot with uh, with five skilled nursing facilities, and that was Barb's uh, Barb Johnson Yellowies's uh, vision for how we demonstrate um, the data that uh, that Andy just talked about and all of the clinics talked about for the benefit of telehealth to document savings as well as better health outcomes for workers and for residents and patients in skilled nursing facilities and assisted living. And so this panel uh, has Deanne Walters, uh, who is the Director of Clinic Affairs for the California Association of Health Facilities, a really important partner to us and enabled with Leticia and Barb to identify partners. Uh, Paula Hertel from the California Assisted Living Association and uh, the California Association of Long-Term Care Medicine, Dr. Carl Steinberg, who has been here the whole time, is going to uh, represent uh, the medical providers for uh, those facilities. So let's start with uh, Deanne Walters. Terrific. Thank you very much. Really appreciate being here today with all of you. Um, I work with the California Association of Health Facilities, and we are an association for skilled nursing facilities across California. Uh, we represent almost 900 of the 1,200 skilled nursing facilities. And in regards to skilled nursing and telemedicine, you know, we've, we haven't had a great long history. Uh, for um, I've been in, in skilled nursing for 20 years, and I remember the day when we put in computers and we you know, started wiring the building for wireless. And truly, we couldn't really wire because the walls were cement, and so the wires had to be run through the, the, the hallways. So, um, it's been a long haul to, to get us even where we're currently at. Um, not all facilities at this point in time have electronic health records. Um, unlike hospitals, skilled nursing weren't funded to bring in that technology. And so we still have a good chunk of our facilities across California that don't have electronic health records. So, you know, moving from there into actually providing telehealth services is, is kind of going to be a leap for, for many. Um, when, um, when I was last in a facility, we brought in telehealth. We used local hospitalists and um, trying to get the doctors familiar with telemedicine as well as our nurses was, was a really big ask. And it took, it took well over a year and a lot of different um, plan, do, study, act processes in order to figure out the best way to get the nurses um, comfortable with that. That's just on the staff side, not talking about our residents and, and elder care. So uh, we have a lot of concerns over, you know, the nurses. They have a fear of, of course, technology. Some of our nurses, you know, they've been around a while, some are newer, but even then, using technology in the skilled nursing facility is a little bit, uh, seems overwhelming compared to, you know, what their normal practices are. And so getting through that process change is a little bit of a challenge for us. Um, of course, and then getting our residents comfortable with the thought. So, of course, as, as telemedicine is kind of rolling around out there and will, and people will experience it more in their primary care physician visits, it will really help as they transition and allow uh, us to utilize that resource in skilled nursing. And um, I know that because of COVID, our current situation, a lot of facilities have rolled into, just like all of you, um, increased use of telemedicine. We were granted um, 
up to $3,000 each facility if they applied for it to bring in um, technology to help support um, you know, vir visits virtually as well as physician visits. And so I know that a, a good portion of facilities took advantage of that. In other situations, staff were utilizing their own personal devices to pr try and help residents connect with their families and loved ones as um, the rules for, for visiting skilled nursing, I'm not sure if everybody knows, was that only only required healthcare personnel were going to be allowed in skilled nursing. And so this, this giant wall fell down between our residents and their loved ones and their voices. And so a lot of our staff really had to step up to to provide that that leap over so that they could be connected with their family and loved ones. And so a lot of people were talking about they're using their own personal devices, they're bringing in their iPads from home, whatever it took in order to connect those residents. And I know our physicians felt a little bit cut off as well because, you know, we're saying only if necessary. And so we really needed um, to connect our, our, our physicians with those residents. And so it has been a very fast learning curve. Um, I know that some of the facilities I've spoken with say, honestly, that only about like 5% of their residents are, are utilizing that telehealth service. Um, they have a lot of concerns over, the residents have concerns of some of the residents, they can't do it on their own. And so it really is a staff, um, a staff time that, that is involved in all of those visits. Um, in the past, we would take patients out to their, their specialty appointments because their primary care physicians would typically see them in skilled nursing. And so it's usually specialty care where they would go out. And so it does save some staff time, of course, in, in participating and going along on those visits. But in general, it really does take staff time and convincing and, and getting the resident, you know, prepped and ready to go to, to be a part of that. Um, but it can help us reduce, you know, like we're talking about that, that transportation footprint that we have, and, and that's huge benefit as we grow this for our residents. Um, you know, we have residents that would have to be ready two hours before an appointment because the transportation company gives you a two-hour window in which they're going to pick someone up. So this person has to be ready to leave two hours before their appointment. They have the time, then they have to wait for their appointment, and then they have to wait at the doctor's office for up to two hours again for that transportation company meet them and bring them back. So you're easily talking anytime there's a resident appointment outside the facility five plus hours, and that includes not just the residence time where they have to sit there and wait, but also the staff time. And then the staff, to, you know, they, we always have to prepare meals for them, right? So that they, you know, don't have blood sugar issues when they're out. So there's a lot that goes into that, that appointment. And so this telemedicine bump that we're, we're seeing is really going to help relieve some of those concerns, not just for staff time, but for the residents being away from the facility and their comfort of their own home. Um, we mostly see in skilled nursing that it's still being used around telehealth. So prior, excuse me, it's a behavioral health. Um, so before, you know, it was really rural use of telemedicine, really focused around behavioral health. And we still see a huge portion of what, what happens to be that behavioral health part. Um, slow adoption of your, your regular primary visits. And so that's kind of like the situation that we're, we're currently in. A lot of issues around some people are talking just the, the technology and then where to put the technology. So we need more than one set of equipment, but then where is that put? Because we really only have a med room and that's medications. And so where does this equipment get set? Where is it accessible for the staff and skilled nursing to get it immediately upon need and then provide it to the residents? Um, so there are a lot of um, a lot of those interesting things that are affecting us. Um, so acceptance of staff, acceptance of residents, the, the location and, and actual technology that should be used. And I heard people speaking of EPIC. Uh, you know, of course, in skilled nursing, we don't run EPIC. We have a whole different EHR system. Um, we have some major players in the field. So it's just a handful, but it still is quite varied. And we really don't have the partnership with a lot of hospital systems for that, the HIE in order to do that health information exchange. And so hopefully um, those partnerships have grown during this time with our, our, our hospital systems, but we still have such a long way to go where the hospitals are willing to share down to skilled nursing and the skilled nursing facilities being able to share back into the, the hospital system. So a long way to go. A lot of people are still concerned about HIPAA. I've heard that mentioned here many times in the privacy issue. 
most residents are not in single rooms. Um, it is not the way skilled nursing is set up. And so we have that issue with, you know, if I'm taking my doctor's visit here, you know, there's a curtain there, but is that really privacy enough? So both concerns from residents on that end, as well as um, our staff going, how do I provide this privacy? So um, a lot of interesting things, but we are seeing it grow. We have a lot of providers that are very interested in getting into the space and really making it work. Obviously, having the waivers so that pe the doctors can bill for it is extraordinary, and we are definitely willing to take advantage of it. Um, but of course, some of our doctors, as I say, are only in the long-term care space, and you know they are not uh, maybe set up to the, do the billing for it and all that kind of stuff. And so it's just taking a lot of um, time to get to that point where we can really utilize it. So we have a long way to go, uh, but we're definitely willing to, to jump in. And um, I know Dr. Steinberg has quite a bit more um, in his presentation around kind of the space and, and all the work that he's put into telemedicine and, and, and looking at that. So I will wrap up with that and be available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Deanne. So this is really helpful maybe as little as 5% with all of the challenges, but opportunities to protect health and to provide better care and to prevent the visits and the, and the, dis and the, and the transport uh, to facilities. Very helpful, uh, thank you. Uh, and I uh, do want to uh, express our appreciation for your assistance with the pilot uh, that Barb has uh, developed and designed and to do that data um, documentation of everything that you've just uh, talked about and do a shout out to AMD Telehealth that's joined us as a partner in contributing uh, expertise uh, to, the, to the pilot. With that, uh, let's, uh, let's turn to uh, Paula Hartel, Hartel, who is from, uh, it actually is Rutel, I think, uh, from uh, our Assisted Living Association. Paula. You're on mute. Oh, we got to get Paula off of mute. Am Here I off go. mute? Okay. We are. And I think Leticia is going to share the PowerPoint with you. Hold on just a second. Let me make sure that Rosa has it que queued up, if you don't mind. Can you hold on just for a second? Okay. So as we're looking to that, just let me make sure everyone is understanding. And, and, and by the way, I'm it, uh, assembly member um, uh, 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 <laughs> Cecilia Agler Curry is listening. You may not know that she's uh, masquerading in the background as Melinda Gutierrez, because that's who got her, got, got her on, but that is Cecilia. And so I just want everybody to be on good behavior. She's listening because she's going to do the call to action. And uh, we have in our senior facilities that we're talking about, our senior population, not only skilled nursing facilities, but assisted living. So you've got these two companion pieces of, uh, of the care continuum from Deanne and Paula. Are we ready to go with Paula's slides not yet? There we are. Okay, well, I'm gonna get started here. First, I wanna thank you for including us in this listening session. It's, you know, it's been a difficult year for all of us, but particularly for those of us in assisted living, senior living, and of course, skilled nursing, um, for our members, for our families, for our residents, for our staff. Um, and what we're really hoping that comes out of this is some good. And I think our adoption of looking at technology as a way to help us, in particular, looking at how telehealth can help us. And um, I don't want to lose the... Um, relationship connection, because I think that um, our model, because it's driven by a different regulatory agency, it's driven by um, a more private pay market, we're very diverse, that um, we've had a harder time sort of collaborating because we are, are so diverse and the definition of assisted living is, um, you know, small board and cares to, you know, three, 400 uh, unit CCRC. So, um, Leticia, I think you're going to have to turn for me. Okay. So I wanted to take just a few minutes to kind of tell you 
who we are and then who Cala serves. So assisted living is in California's licensed residential care facilities for the elderly and we're licensed under the Department of Social Services Community Care Licensing Division. In California, there's over 7,000 RCFEs, licensed RCFEs. Of that, over 6,000 of them are what we call board and care, small homes, six, six beds or fewer. So um, you can see that there's, um, there's a lot of licensed beds. The, the um, providers that CALA really serves and the primarily our members uh, have usually have larger, larger um, unit counts and capacity. And so you can see that of the 60, 671 provider members that we have, they have 56,000 units in a much higher license capacity bed because some people have shared units. And of those 620 are assisted living and memory care, 51 are continuing care retirement communities. And even within our member body, it's very diverse. We have people that um, serve primarily an independent market where people come in and they want really lifestyle services to people and um, providers that are very focused on transitions and end of life care. So um, if you could go to the next slide, Leticia. Um, I just wanted you to get a quick snapshot that even though we have this, this large diverse resonant profile, um, there are some there are some commonalities and some things that we really want to focus on that I think impact how we look at um, telemedicine and how we look at opportunities and even some of the some of the barriers. Um, one of the very important things to us is looking at at what outcomes are. And um, for those of you who know uh, assisted living communities or have had loved ones um, living in our communities, you will know that we're very um, resident focused and, and so collecting data and having metrics that, that we can share from a state level uh, are, are relatively rare. But some of the sort of uh, commonalities amongst all of our providers is how do we look at um, the risk factors that we have. And if you um, um, go to the next slide for me, I think that would be helpful. We wanna really look at these risk factors through the lens of the vision and culture of our providers, which is engagement and lifestyle, being customer driven and having both autonomy for our residents and autonomy for the companies that are operating um, assisted living in, in our state. Um, however, we have these commonalities of wanting to make sure that we're addressing falls, medication management, elopement risk, negative or harmful behaviors, and cardiac issues, because all of these outcomes increase our risk for unnecessary 911 calls or negative outcomes and incidents that occur in assisted living. So we really believe that um, if we can improve our um, collaboration with the medical model and with um, physicians and those that are doing um, telemedicine, that those are the areas where we have the most, the most opportunity. So if you could go to the next slide. A lot of people on this listening session today have talked about resources, connectivity, privacy, all really important. I wanted to take the short time that I have here today to talk about um, the operational aspects and the outcomes that are really most important to our members and, and to the residents who live in assisted living. So um, as I said earlier, we don't have um, volumes of data for telehealth or, or um, healthcare outcomes in California. So I have this small study to share with you, which was really looking at the, the usage of telehealth in assisted living, you can see from this graph that that um, of the 22 senior living providers that were part of this survey, 75% of them have looked at um, and used telehealth for primary care. Um, about 45% of them have used it for emergent health. So something's going on. I need to get quick input from a clinical staff and about 30% have used it for, for mental or behavioral health challenges. And the COVID-19 pandemic 
helped by doctors being able to be reimbursed for telehealth, we're seeing these numbers, anecdotally seeing these numbers go up and up. So um, that's where I think the opportunities are as we get more comfortable with the collaboration and there's a reimbursement structure to be able to continue to do that to do this. I think we're going to see um, uh, an increased use and and better outcomes for our residents. One of the things that we haven't talked about at all in this um, in this session is um, dementia and mild cognitive impairment. And there's some statistics that say that 40 to 50% of residents living in, in an assisted living environment have some level of dementia or mild cognitive impairment. And um, in memory care, where you have de designated programs focused on people that are mostly at moderate to higher levels of dementia, those people um, providing those services and those programs will tell you over and over again that even before this pandemic, trying to get um, good primary care for a resident who has moderate to, to severe dementia is really difficult. Just the, the transfer trauma of getting somebody from their daily routine program into a car, into the hospital or into a clinic to see somebody um, is stressful. And so doing that, doing that clinical assessment once you're in, in a clinical setting isn't giving good outcomes anyway. So we really see a um, incredible benefit for telehealth, for primary care and emergent issues for that particular population. So I wanted to make sure that that was noted in this, li this listening session that we really do need to look at that population. If you could go to the next slide for me. Um, we are in our, in our um, industry using telehealth and, and some of the technologies already. And so I put in, in this slide just um, some quick things that, that you guys all may be aware of, but telehealth tablets and being able to do QI work when we have COVID-19 in a community has been really helpful. And we're seeing a, a huge uptick of that. We're seeing an uptick of using it for remote assessments and screening both of residents and of staff. Um, care coordination applications have been, um, been really beneficial to us for that continuity of care. Uh, those, you, those of you on this call may know about the Lighthouse program project that is a collaboration with many, many people, including um, partners through Citrus at UC Berkeley and Escaton and Front Porch. It's looking um, not, not specifically at assisted living, but low income um, senior housing and how older adults can have access to telemedicine, telehealth, um, including hardware, software training and collaboration with others. And so we're looking closely at how can that translate to the, a, a larger population. Um, and then I've talked briefly about the four areas that we really think that there are opportunities, which is assessments, emergency specialty interventions, primary care oversight for memory care people with living with dementia, and then chronic physical and mental health needs. So um, I'd like to work with this, this um, group about how does that get implemented in a non-medical clinical setting where, where community autonomy and, um, and this idea that, that driven by wellness and not a medical model, how can we have this as an overlay into those cultures? So if you go to the last slide, uh, briefly I'll talk about, I'll skip this one because I know that we're running short on time. So if you just go to the last, last slide. Here um, from our perspective are the barriers and opportunities for expanding uh, telehealth, telemedicine in, into our assisted living communities. And I, again, because of time, I won't go through all of these, but um, one that I wanted to highlight on the barriers is that we have these risk and re uh, regulatory restraints. We've had our RCFE regulations for a, a long, long time and our industry has changed in how we deliver care. When I first got into this work um, 30 some years ago, we um, always said we're a social model, really is about lifestyle and allowing people to live in community. And that value is still very strong in our, in our communities. 
but um, there is this rec uh, recognition that there is a healthcare medical overlay. But some of our regulatory restraints require us, for example, I put the 87465 regulation, which um, really directs us from a regulatory perspective to call 911 when there's an incident that could require um, medical intervention. And so there's this rub that if we're using um, telehealth and getting clinical assessments from a physician or a nurse practitioner, how do we deal with this 911 issue? And we've done some, we've done a lot of work and a lot of public policy collaboration, for instance, with the Hospice Association to deal with that for someone who's at end of life care that really doesn't want to go to the hospital. So I think that that, that is something that as um, a collaborative body, we need to look at in non-medical communities that have residents who have healthcare needs, scheduled and unscheduled healthcare needs, how do we collaborate so that we continue to increase quality of care, recognizing that assisted living isn't and does not want to become um, a medical model. Um, the other piece that I think is a barrier um, for us that we need to address, and I think that, that with training we can address it, is that many of our residents have multi-symptom um, chronic and acute symptoms. And so you have cardiac issues, you have dementia, you may have some behavioral health, you have diabetes. And from a, from a delivery of care system, how do you address um, good assessments and good primary care for these, for these residents in um, a telehealth um, environment? And then over onto the opportunities and, and challenges that we need to solve, we are really excited that there's this opportunity and, and one of the earlier speakers talked about, you know, being able to access specialists and, and particularly geriatricians for us from, from all over the country because trying to find a geriatrician who can make house visits or even that you can get an appointment to to go to a clinic in um, many areas of California is very, very difficult and we all know that there are very special needs for um, our older adult population. And um, so I think that that's really important. Many of our providers are working with managed care and the ALW program through the state. And I think there's some really opportunities to create not only um, a primary care, but a really a long-term wellness model that looks at continuum of care for um, telehealth, for clinicians, for physical therapists and um, occupational therapists and speech therapists to come in and work in a really collaborative way in our community. So we're looking forward to, to working with you to figure out how we do that. And of course, the reimbursement piece that everybody's talking about is the driver and um, the connectivity um, has to be there. We've had some of the same problems that um, that was talked about earlier, you know, you have these walls that you can put as many repeaters on, but that don't always go through cement as easily. So there's the physical plan issues, but I'm really focused on, you know, how do we, in a very resident focused, resident directed way, how do we change the model of care so that access is open to all? Thank you so much, Paula. Uh, excellent slides, excellent uh, organization of, of the issues. Um, you're all making uh, the job of a report to legislators very easy. Uh, so uh, I thank you for that and they, they will be greatly appreciative. And I think at the beginning of your slide when you said uh, half of the patients are over the age of 85, yes, it's, a, it's pretty compelling as to the, the whole continuum of care that is needed. And now we turn to, for our final panelist in this panel, is Dr. Carl Steinberg, who is um, a past president of the uh, Association of Long-Term Care Medical uh, Providers and has for over 25 years practiced medicine in skilled nursing facilities and in long-term care facilities and hospice in San Diego County, Dr. Steinberg. Hi, thanks for having me. And I'm gonna kind of burn through my slides. There's so much to go through and we're so behind because there's been so much amazing stuff and I appreciate uh, uh, being invited to participate here. 
And yes, I've been a, a hospice and nursing home medical director in San Diego County for 25 years. I still, I make nursing home visits. I make visits to uh, various assisted living, boarding cares, and I make house calls. And uh, so, uh, you know, kind of uh, boots on the ground. Go ahead and advance the slide, please. Um, and I have to admit that, uh, you know, the, our industry is still, I mean, we literally use faxes. I mean, uh, some of you young kids on this call don't probably know what that is, but we still use faxes to uh, do prescriptions and to send orders in and for changes of condition. And it would be nice to bring that up. COVID-19 has really launched us into a new era here. And I hope, I, I hope that uh, out of the many devastating things that have happened that uh, some good will come out of it as we've been talking about. Um, so in nursing homes, uh, there was a limit of one visit every 30 days by telemedicine. I'm not quite sure why we were so discriminated against by CMS. Um, our national organization, AMDA, um, had been lobbying for years to say, you know, shouldn't it be based on medical necessity? Isn't it stupid if you can do a telemedicine visit to assess a change of condition that you can't then do a follow-up visit? I mean, if the whole idea is to keep people out of the hospital, then why on earth couldn't you at least do a follow-up visit? Well, Right now, it's all been waived. You can do as many tele telemedicine visits in a nursing home as you want right now. And these waivers have, have really opened up the door. You know, you can do telephone visits. Um, and there's a proposed rule that the comment period just closed on that will allow for one telehealth visit every three days in a skilled nursing facility setting. Again, seems arbitrary. We asked them to just base it on medical necessity. We'll see what the final rule comes out, but at least that part is better. Um, and uh, go ahead and advance this slide. But I think the main point here is that we really want to have people not uh, have to access a higher level of care when they don't need to. And for those of you who don't know, nursing homes, sorry about my dog, uh, take care of very sick people uh, these days. You know, we do IVs, we do complex wound care. Basically, a lot of the post acute population now are people who would have been in the hospital 10, 15 years ago. So we have found that telemedicine visits or virtual visits can be super effective, not just for, for routine care or, to, or for seeing how they're- gonna have to give her a recommendation. Improving, but, also, but also- But also- she doesn't uh, have space in her computer, which can cause problems, I think Google is- I'm not sure. Marianne, yeah, okay, go ahead. Go, Dr. Karlberg, uh, we apologize, but it, and I actually don't mind your dog because, uh, uh, we, we actually think people should be more like our dogs and they're such great companions. So go ahead. Okay. Um, but anyway, also for, uh, for um, looping in people for family meetings. I mean, we haven't talked much about palliative care, but I think that's a super important. In this population of elders and, and other chronically ill people, palliative care is super important and uh, advanced care planning and not subjecting people to treatment that they don't want. And so it's been surprising uh, you know, how effective these visits can be without having to actually be in, uh, in person. So we're hoping some of these waivers will be made permanent. Uh, right now, initial comprehensive visits are, are allowed uh, by telemedicine and uh, nurse practitioners, PAs uh, can do those visits. And historically there's been concern that these that it could be abused, that people are going to be just too lazy to drive to the nursing home and, and uh, just do these visits by telemedicine instead. And we hope that's not the case, but they do require staff time, as Deanne was talking about, and that needs to be calculated into any programs. Um, also importantly, and for you guys doing the pilot, um, I, I, I so support that. And West Health here in San Diego has done some pilots in uh, long-term care settings. I, I really think it's a wave of the future, um, but who should be on the other side? And Paula, I love that you said, you know, it should be a geriatrician. You know, there was this uh, proposed law that, uh, that was floating through Congress a year or two ago um, that would have an emergency room doc on the other end. And with all due respect to emergency room doctors, they're not geriatricians. And, um, you know, hospitalists are not geriatricians. They do a lot of things that we don't like, you know, that uh, use antipsychotics on people who really shouldn't be getting them, uh, you know, put people on sliding scale insulin and things like that. So, um, I just strongly encourage you to have competent people who know geriatrics and who know nursing home regulations on the other end of that line. Um, next slide. So a little about assisted living. Um, you know, they have been clinging to that we're not medical mantra for decades now. And I think Paula, you know, you know it's clear 
that um, as much as you want to be a social model, there are sick people there and there has to be a way to take care of those sick people. And I really think telemedicine is going to be a huge game changer in this arena. I really do. Um, you know, now, how do you actually operationalize that? How do you get a geriatrician on the other end of the line or, or a geriatric nurse practitioner? But that will save all those visits that Title 22 is currently forcing us. You know, somebody has some minor change of condition and nobody likes it, right? The paramedics hate it, the ERs hate it, the patients hate it, and, and we hate it. So um, to the extent we can uh, modify those regs and, and CalTCM, our long-term care association is working with DSS and I, there are gonna be some regulatory changes that were in the works, but then COVID sort of, you know, took over everything. Uh, but, you know, how does a small six bed get medical supervision? You know, how, how who's gonna pay for that? Um, and then Paula, you mentioned hospice and, you, you know, hospice does get inappropriately used uh, in, in assisted living. And, you know, it's, it's uh, people don't meet the six month life expectancy or they don't, uh, or they don't really want hospice in the sense that if they got sick, they actually would want to go to the hospital. Um, so uh, that's another, another kind of side issue. So next slide. Uh, and a little about hospice. Um, again, surprisingly effective, uh, you know, hospice is kind of high touch, right? I mean, we hug our patients, we put our hands on that, you know, um, it's, it's remarkable what can be done on a call like this with, uh, uh, you know, somebody who's critically, you know, terminally ill and their family members. Um, it's not a full substitute for it, but it can really help. And uh, during this pandemic, we have observed sometimes, you know, people get sick really fast with COVID, maybe too fast for hospice to get involved. So I, I really encourage anyone who has any influence on this to make sure that our primary care workforce uh, has basic palliative care knowledge. You know, we, we need to really mobilize primary palliative care and primary geriatric care, right? A lot of the doctors in the community, they treat a 90 year old like a 40 year old and, you know, they're throwing, uh, let's, let's bring your cholesterol down and you know, let's, let's get tight diabetic control which is does a lot more harm than good in this population. Uh, inappropriate antibiotic use, all those things. So, uh, and we do have a, a significant workforce shortage in geriatrics and in palliative care. So to the extent we can educate people um, and then use telemedicine so that we can make it more efficient um, so people can have access to the specialty care, that's great. And I think that's it for my slides. And I just, uh, um, the other thing that I've found helpful is we can do um, home health visits. We can have a home health nurse out and then do a telemedicine visit while the home health is there. If they've got a wound or something like that, we can look at it. Um, and I, I appreciate the, uh, the equity aspects of this. And I do think that uh, both the mental health and, and there's some other specialties that lend themselves especially well to this, like diagnostic dermatology. Um, but we really need, uh, we need mental health assistance too in, in uh, some of the long-term care settings with dementia and other conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Steinberg. And thank you for your dedication to palliative care and hospice uh, and bringing that into focus in this conversation. Really appreciate that. Dr. Steinberg talked about high touch and that the corollary from John Nisbet of Megatrends in 1982 was high tech. And so it is a combination of the high touch that uh, high tech actually enables so we can use that opportunity for the high touch in a more effective way. Uh, just wanted to uh, acknowledge that. And uh, to go to our responders, because I'm not gonna leave them out, um, uh, Cecilia is, has her mask on. I'm going to make her wait because you really want to hear from Cecilia, uh, not leave. But uh, we're very delighted that we've got a uh, responding AARP and the SCAN Foundation. And through this entire uh, gathering, Julie Bates has been doing everything I've been doing. I'm shaking our heads, yes, right? And she is the Associate Director for AARP. Uh, I should also say Barbara O'Connor served on the national board of AARP, so it's in our DNA. And, um, and then we have Megan Burke from the SCAN Foundation. So let's go first to AARP Associate Director for the state, uh, Julie Bates. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Sunny. And what a wonderful 
panel to be a part of. You know, it's oftentimes when we hear about long-term care, we hear all of the negative things that can have occurred in long-term care and, and regretfully still, still do, but this group of individuals get it and they understand. Um, and so I'm gonna be quick, right? You know, we know that high-speed internet, broadband, Wi-Fi have been proven to be integral to all components of life and living. And this is an unintended beneficial awareness that has come as a result of the pandemic. Our long-term care infrastructure was not fully prepared to pivot to this delivery model of care delivery, uh, recreation, social engagement, and, and healthcare supports. Our facilities, no matter their location, urban, rural, mountain, and valley, must have connectivity for the residents and facility operations. The utilization of telehealth for residents has long-term beneficial potential. It reduces the negative impacts um, of having to leave the facility, whether it's a skilled nursing facility or an assisted living uh, residence, uh, that can occur when having to leave the facility when one is unwell or to have a hospitalization for care. Um, it is a necessary tool and tactic in the healthcare delivery toolbox to have access to telehealth and all of the things that are necessary to make telehealth a reality. I have uh, five uh, recommendations. And of course, the first one is to make permanent um, all of these expansions and waivers that have been put into place in order to have the delivery model continue to operate efficiently and effectively throughout the healthcare delivery system. We need to expand the utilization of the electronic health record so that the patient's information goes wherever the patient may be, whether it's home or to the hospital or to their doctor's visits. We need to ensure that payment continues. Uh, this whole idea of uh, pay equity and pay payment parity. We need to expand licensure so that we can continue to have access to the appropriate health professional uh, wherever that professional is to provide the care wherever the patient is. And, you know, I am a PhD prepared gerontologist and I have spent my entire life uh, in the service of my elders spending time in acute care hospitals, skilled nursing, assisted living administration, um, and home health as well as state work in AARP. And one of the things that, that comes to mind for me is this, the access to and the implementation of high-speed internet to every home will need to be a campaign similar to those that brought electricity and the telephone to our home environment for generations past. It is something that must be accomplished. We now see it in in plain view, you know, we've been talking about bringing high-speed internet and telehealth for years. And there was always this, oh, well, broadband, well, well, that's too expensive, it's too this, it's too that, the infrastructure's too much. Well, now we all know we can't live, we can't work, we can't get healthcare, we can't learn without it. And so I'm very hopeful uh, that, again, an unintentional, unintentional beneficial outcome of COVID-19 will be this change. Thank you, Dr. Bates, and uh, we are so glad to have AARP here to join in this quest. Um, I can't tell you uh, how excited I'm sure Cecilia is to hear that uh, call for investment in broadband. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Julie. And from the SCAN Foundation, we're delighted to have Megan Burke. Good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, it's, I've really actually enjoyed this um, really engaging discussion this morning and the passion that you all bring um, to the issues that are raised. Um, I think, um, I, I actually really appreciate the fact that we have a panel focused on um, assisted living, long-term care. Um, when we, a lot of the conversations around telehealth really do focus in on those clinic visits and there's so much more that we can do with telehealth when it comes to long-term services and supports. Um, I, I found the conversation that I think Deanne and Dr. Steinberg for sure raised around just the stress and trauma related to going outside of a facility for appointments and um, the opportunity that we have in telehealth to um, address that is just huge. Um, 
I also appreciated uh, Deanne raising uh, just the staffing issues. Uh, many moons ago, like early in my career, I worked as a social service director in a skilled nursing facility. And uh, when I was thinking about this panel, I was like, oh, it's great because then you wouldn't go through the stress of sending folks out to the appointments. But oh my gosh, the demand on staff, it's, it's a new way of thinking about things. Um, I think one of the things that um, I feel is a little bit left out, um, Dr. Steinberg touched on it, is really that family engagement. And, um, you know, when we think about caregivers, you're thinking of the family caregiver and they're taking care of somebody in the home, but you're still a family caregiver when your family member is in a, in a residential facility, in a skilled nursing facility, because you're still checking in, you're still connecting with the physicians. And so how do we use telehealth to engage family members and caregivers if that is the choice of the individual, right? Um, I think very specifically of a friend of mine who lives out of state and is incredibly engaged in managing the healthcare for her parents. And so telehealth gives us this opportunity to engage uh, caregivers in a better way. Um, and then I just, I, I wanna reinforce, I think um, what Paula raised around just some of the regulations and how we really take a serious look at the regs um, to be able to evaluate and evolve um, because we are in a new environment with, and there are new opportunities through telemedicine. So not leaving certain industries behind and being able to bring them along with us um, so that ultimately individuals have a good care experience, you know, um, so. Excellent, excellent, Megan. And I want to say to you and to Dr. Bates and to Deanne and to Paula and uh, Dr. Steinberg, um, around the regs in particular, uh, do take that next level of drill down and give it to us specifically so we can actually submit it as a part of uh, this record. Um, and remember, uh, Diane Davis has been giving us lots of messages on chat, and I want to just uh, uh, thank you and remind everybody to do the same because we're going to take your questions on chat, those exact questions. So I hope you did a good job of editing them and also the answers and make them part of the record. And uh, that leads me to um, have the pleasure of introducing a, a long time uh, community leader, civic leader, uh, champion of, of broadband and getting people connected and has very much been involved uh, with telehealth recently and looking at uh, how children's hospitals are connected. And um, I got dragged into uh, being a partner uh, with uh, now assembly member Cecilia Aguilar Curry when she was mayor of Winters. Uh, of, 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 a charming little town in, uh, not actually so little, and she built it a lot as mayor, um, in Yellow County. Uh, great wine, great food, so uh, put it, uh, when you can uh, go out again, uh, you'll want to visit Winters. I think the Chamber of Commerce should pay me, uh, Cecilia. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, she came to the assembly, and, uh, well, I should actually say, the reason we got dragged in is that she had gotten um, a, a, a grant for computers from the, the, the uh, Yoshidishi tribe. And uh, then we uh, uh, complemented that with our school to home program. And the entire winter's uh, joint union school district of uh, I think about 1800 students anyway has all gone one to one uh, with devices and really amazing, amazing transformation led by a mayor to join forces with the with the um, school district. And as uh, a member of the assembly, she chairs the local government committee with her expertise in, in local government as a mayor, but has been uh, a co-author of the Internet for All Now Act of 2017. And then this year, as everybody has said, amazingly, you know, the world changed with uh, the pandemic. Uh, and there was just a, a rude awakening laid bare the whole problems of a digital cliff, as we say, because people are just falling off. 
into greater isolation, deeper poverty. And then everybody solved the problem, but nobody would step forward and say, we got to put money in. And uh, Cecilia took on that responsibility, uh, became author of the Internet for All Act, Internet for All uh, Act of 2020, and made great strides in a few months, and now is the author of the Internet for All uh, <laughs> Act of 2021. Uh, where we'll get the job done. Uh, at least that's the um, the bill draft I saw yesterday. So now I've announced it and think you're uh, obligated. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, and I, I, I thank you for being here. I just go call out also to your staff, uh, Samantha Samuelson, who made sure that you were here and you stayed and all of those things. So uh, it's a pleasure. And ladies and gentlemen, we're going to welcome the Honorable Cecilia Aguiar-Curry. Hi, good good afternoon, I guess it is. Hi, everyone, how are you? I am standing in the middle of a vineyard right now. I'm on a tour up in Sonoma County, uh, wanting to make sure I understand all the intricacies of um, our rural uh, uh, farm workers. And I just toured a farm worker housing and we talked a little bit about the importance of telehealth and broadband con connectivity and the importance to our ag industry. So it touches every single uh, aspect in California for economic development. It touches all of our families, but I want to thank you for having me again, Sunny. It's been years that we worked so hard together and we're, we will continue to do this uh, incredible work um, and make sure that our uh, constituents, the entire state of California, whether you're rural or urban, are, uh, are connected. But today we're talking about telehealth. And as we know, telehealth is a life-saving tool, um, and particularly during COVID, um, we realized the inequities that are out there, right? We realized that we didn't have connectivity, but we realized that healthcare access was really important. And those of our patients that are trying to visit a doctor are very apprehensive in, uh, going into the doctor. So telehealth answered a lot of those questions. So we're finding more and more patients are embracing the virtual care revolution that is here and it's here to stay. And I was very interested, and I'm sure there's a lot more notes that Sam's taking for me, but to understand um, some of the challenges are really important to me. Um, obviously, there's a lot of opportunity, and I think that we can get through it. Um, personally, I have really good friends that are doctors, and they said this has changed their practice, and getting reimbursed made it even more so. So um, I think it's the wave of the future, and that's where we're going to go. So, um, so we found out the surveys in the United States that 71% of patients have considered telemedicine, while 50% have already gone through a, a virtual appointment. I too recently wanted to have a, had a swollen ankle. I got logged on with my doctor, they diagnosed it and it saved me the time to go down to the doctor's office and um, it saved just a lot of time and my fear of, you know, of going into a, a, a doctor's office with COVID going around. So in California, the inequities of healthcare access has been, uh, have been laid bare through the COVID pandemic, especially with a severe shortage of providers in our rural areas within the state. I represent six counties, very rural area. And one of the things we've acknowledged all along was the access, lack of access to healthcare. And telemedicine has really answered our, our plea in so many ways. Do we have more work to do? Absolutely, obviously with connectivity. But what we do have is particularly um, in one of my counties, they said they've seen a 750% increase people using telepsychiatry. They're getting online. They're uh, people that have mental health appointments that generally won't get on a, a, a bus or get to a doctor's appointment are now being able to do these like a Zoom or a FaceTime. I mean, I don't know about you, but I think that's wonderful because we've talked about mental health and the lack of mental health pro, uh, providers and professionals. This is one of the many answers that we have for them. So um, uh, obviously um, the use of telehealth in my district varies greatly due, due to uh, accessibility ch uh, challenges between the insurers, the providers, patients' ability to get on the internet. So I've heard so many wonderful stories uh, in my district, we've got to keep this moving on and I need all of you behind us to do it. And I understand your challenges because we don't, I don't have the magic wand, but what I do have is the ability to listen and to understand what some of the needs that you have had so far. So um, this is this kind of the things that we found, found in the past couple of years during my tours um, of, of rural districts. 
Um, I've authored and supported several groundbreaking policies to expand the access and use of uh, telehealth technology. So first one we did was AB 744 and creates telehealth parity by requiring that a health plan or insurer must reimburse a healthcare provider for services delivered to an enrollee in telehealth, even if those services are covered when in person. Then we also did AB 1494 that ensured that during a declared state of emergency, our community clinics can be reimbursed for telehealth provided to Medi-Cal patients uh, in the aftermath of a dis disaster. We are going to continue that and we're working with legislation to make that full time. And we had AB 401. Uh, I authored it, that was my very first year as a legislator, and it was the first ever telepharmacy technology in medically underserved California. So if there isn't a pharmacist within a 10 miles, you can have a satellite um, pharmacy. And it's really been uh, helpful, and I've actually seen it implemented by uh, my little town of Winters, now has a satellite over in Esparto, and it's made them so that they are sustainable as a pharmacy. So this year we you know, wanted to expand telehealth services for equal reimbursement for in-person health services and to make permanent the telehealth services subject to federal waivers. Um, I will continue to work on that and I'm gonna to continue to work on that with my, my congressman because I, we need their voice, we need them at the table to help us out to do that. Um, so when our, fav our federal waivers expire as the pandemic winds down, we need to be prepared with state law to continue telehealth parity. So I think we'll all admit is that equity uh, is uh, something that we can use in telemedicine and requires critical investments. And the investments I've heard from many of you, do I have the equipment? Do I have a room? Do I have space? Uh, is everybody trained? Um, but first of all, I mean, that's one of many things that we need but we need to make sure we get internet for all. And we need to make sure we get the internet to all our communities, um, underserved, unserved communities. Um, isn't it a shame that we had to have a pandemic for people to actually realize the importance of having broadband in all of our communities, right? Um, so, you know, we're right at the, um, uh, we're, we're always focusing right now on schools. Yes, that's really important, but look at all the other things we can use it for, for our healthcare for job creation, for training, um, for agriculture, you name it, we cannot be left behind. And I, uh, and I intend to work very hard and with the help of um, CETF and others and my other stakeholders to help us get high speed, uh, in, uh, foolproof uh, quality, uh, high speed internet uh, access for all. So I'm hoping that I can depend on all of you to write letters, tell the governor, tell our speaker, our pro tem, that this is where we need to go. Um, you know, this policy, I'm just gonna throw this, this policy is not easy. And people just think they can pick it up and just do this policy. It is not easy. And as um, Sunny will say, and many of the others that know me, we have struggled to get things through because there's so many stakeholders and everybody wants a piece of the pie. We can do this. We are very close. We are going to reintroduce my bill this year for 2021. Um, uh, do I feel like we can get there? Yes, because I feel like the administration, the Senate and the assembly will work together to make sure we can be successful in getting this forward. So there's no shortage to get, of work to get done and I look forward to working with all of you and all my colleagues at the assembly and the Senate. And um, God bless you, Sunny, for all the things that you have done that we'll continue to do together because um, this is exciting time. We're not going backwards, we're going forwards. And we want all of you at the table, every one of you that are here. I see Richard Polanco, hello, Mr. Polanco. Thank you for being here as well. He's, a, he's been a great proponent of this. We can do it. And um, to see telehealth work, and it worked, right? We were kind of thrown into it. We found out the inequities, but it worked and it will continue. And when I see people say, you know what, I didn't have to go to the doctor. I did it on a telephone. I go, how did it work? I loved it. You know, to have my doctors and friends of mine that are doctors in the nursing profession and hospice. I mean, all these people were just saying, you know, thank God you did that bill. No, thank God I had, um, I listened and I listened to my uh, friends, my stakeholders, that this was important. So again, um, um, thank you so much. I can't wait to get some of the feedback that you had today, Sunny. Uh, just the, the short time I was there for the past 45 minutes, there were some really good points and I, I, uh, we need to use those. So 
Um, we look forward to working with you. We will be coming back with another telehealth or two bills. And lastly, I have an incredible group of, of women that work in the, uh, uh, in the Capitol. My colleagues all wanna be a part of this. Um, if it is a, a conversation with me, please reach out to my colleagues and tell them the importance of telehealth and broadband connectivity. That's what I need. So thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. And your comments that I know Samantha wrote will also be <laughs> available to everybody because you had great information uh, about all the bills that you've done so that yeah. they also are a part of the record. Uh, right. We need to thank Melinda Gutierrez for making sure that uh, you got connected out in the in the <laughs> I hope you get to do a little bit of wine tasting, and I apologize to everybody here because generally we have communion at the end <laughs> of our convening because uh, we mortals need to call upon all of the uh, higher powers we possibly can. So another time, but to thank Cecilia on behalf of all of us and do the final call to action and wrap up is Scenic CEO, Lewis Fox. Lewis. Thank you. I have to run to my tour. Thank you, Cecilia. Sunny gave me the uh, task of providing a uh, brief uh, summary. So I, I want to begin by apologizing for uh, any and all points that uh, I, I don't include because this was an incredibly uh, rich set of conversations. Uh, the first question I was asked to, uh, to, to summarize were, what are the major barriers identified by the presenters? Um, I, 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 I chose three um, uh, for individuals and three for medical institutions and providers. For individuals, um, broadband, and that includes broadband access, access to devices, uh, affordability, and adoption. Uh, number two, language, culture, trust, and ability in telehealth. Number three, lack of consumer information on telehealth. For medical institutions and providers, lack of support for implementation and deployment, training and technical assistance. Number two, general underfunding of telehealth. And number three, uncertainty about reimbursements and continuation of COVID-19 era public policy. Um, the second question I was asked to address were, was what are the key action steps delineated by the presenters? Um, I went for 13 in this arena, um, uh, and here they are. <laughs> uh, invest in broadband access devices, including health monitoring devices and adoption. Two, support multiple modalities. Three, sustain telehealth reimbursements post-COVID. Four, increase governmental uh, investments. Five, expand provider training and technical support. Uh, six, broaden access to virtual telehealth interpretation. Uh, interpreters, interpret, yeah, interpreters. Uh, whatever this is, expand consumer information on telehealth access. Uh, next, understand issues of culture, trust, ability, and provide necessary support structures. Advocate for changes in medical licensure in post-COVID-19. Uh, ensure that public policy and funding are commensurate with current practice and update forms. Um, next, develop comprehensive care. Integrate social and medical care in the telehealth, telehealth context. Uh, second to last, include long-term care facilities in a comprehe comprehensive telemedicine policy. And lastly, understand and address privacy and data security issues. Excellent. So 13 summary. Now, just keep in mind, uh, Lewis did all of this by listening to you. It is an excellent summary of the barriers of the challenges. Um, I am a, a really, we're incredibly appreciative, Lewis, for Scenic, uh, for the, the partners in care, for the Primary Care Association joining us as co-sponsors today. And uh, here's what's, what we will do. I'll just repeat it again. Everybody who has a chat, we're going to record as a part of the record and also answer. Uh, so Leticia is going to be summarizing all your remarks. Everything that was in writing, you want to put in writing, you want to still put on the record, send to us. That all becomes compiled. 
This is exactly what Richard Figueroa said uh, the administration wants, and I know it's what Assembly members Arambula and uh, Aguilar Curry want us to also do. And so that will be available before we all convene again on December 2nd, which is the second listening session that we'll uh, hear from the health plans, the pub, the both the private and the public and the medical centers that are all part of the Scenic Network. So ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the board of the California Emerging Technology Fund, uh, Barbara O'Connor, Renee Martinez, Rich Mata, um, Darian Traub, Jim Kirkland, Martha Escutia, uh, we thank you for joining us, uh, for being a part of this uh, conversation and sharing your expertise so we could listen and have an amazing record of insights, experiences, and recommendations for uh, our policymakers at the state. We are hereby adjourned, and it's only 22 minutes after. Uh, so thank you so much uh, again. We'll see you on December 2nd.